It was clear that the average homeowner and area resident did not matter. Our residents and volunteers poured their hearts into this and were subsequently burnt out. By the end of this process, after the AUC decision was handed down, our government liaison volunteer promptly resigned. She was one of our most engaged volunteers, one of the very few that showed up to every meeting in her four-year tenure. Tired of not being heard, she decided to volunteer with cancer patients, a noble cause. It seemed to her as dealing with potentially dying patients would be less stressful than and rewarding than dealing with EPCOR AUC and the government and disgruntled resident residents with only a pessimistic outlook on the future. Volunteers are hard to replace, her seat sits vacant, and we have no prospects of filling her spot. My family doesn't live on 156, where these high voltage transmission lines will run, but it is the only road leading to my home. Every day I'll drive under them and pass them on my way to work. Every evening I'll walk the entire length of them to pick up my kids from after school care. My family will fly our kites in the Linwood Athletic Field like we always do on windy days. We'll play beside them in the park evenings and weekends. I'll see them from my front yard after the trees are cut down to make way for them. I won't get any power from them. They won't benefit me at all other than the potential devaluation of my property and subsequent redu reduction in property taxes. That benefit won't see feel so beneficial when I hear realtors tell me what my home is worth on the market if I decide to move. These lines are an assault on the families of Linwood and a black eye of our elected officials. They belong underground. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sim. Next is Rick Ennis. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, proceed. Okay. Um, my name is Rick Ennis. I live uh, along the uh, corridor in Elmwood. I've lived here since 1979. Um, it looked considerably different then. Um, I kept hearing in various conversations about this line that um, it could run down my back alley 14 feet from my house, or not from my house, but from my property line, uh, because uh, it was designated as a utility corridor. So I got a hold of a Brian DeJong from Alberta Transportation and a Natalie Lazerko from the city of Edmonton, who both told me that the White Mud Drive is a road and it's not registered as a utility corridor. Um, your city bylaw 15100 says that the city shall advocate that high voltage transmission lines be buried when adjacent to residential neighborhoods. And I really, knowing, knowing the, the, the layout of that line, I can't imagine anything being more adjacent than the ones running through Elmwood and Lin Linwood. Um, the entire section of that map that appears in some of those documents you have in front of you there, sections A and B of that line, which is Linwood and Elmwood, should definitely receive funding for the burial of the lines. And I think that funding could come from monies allocated to West End LRT construction by federal, provincial, and municipal governments. Burial of the line is required as part of the constructing of the infrastructure necessary to build this project. And I suspect that the extra power requirements that necessitate this line being built come primarily from West End LRT needs. The estimate to bury that line for Elmwood and Linwood is $9 million. And it's a plus or minus 30%. So perhaps as little as 6 million, perhaps as much as 12. The city does have an opportunity. This is in, I put this in quotation marks because it comes from page 249 of your 257 minute pages. The city does have an opportunity to apply under section 17 of the Hydro and Electrical Energy Act to have all or part of the line buried. Um, and that's also part of a report labeled FCS 00109. I uh, took the opportunity the other day to take a drive out the freeway to Anthony Hende, and I noticed that most of those large poles have been installed uh, from the Hende to 170th Street. And I found it odd that the poles were installed on the traffic side of the berm slash sound wall, depending on what exists at any particular point. But through Elmwood and Linwood, Elmwood for sure, down our back alley, they want to move it from running down the 
traffic side of the white mud freeway to running down my back alley 14 feet from my driveway. Um, I would really ask council to seriously consider burying these lines and if they cannot bury the lines, at least move them so that they're less offensive to us and don't get in the way of backing our vehicles out of our garages. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ennis. Next is Linda Lee. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Okay, thank you. My name is Linda. Uh, we have lived in Linwood for close to 30 years, on directly on 156th Street, and we're impacted by the power lines. We hope to spend another 30 years in this wonderful, mature community, but with the high power lines combined with climate change, we are reconsidering. Our house is like right underneath the lines, and if those lines topple, what are the safety issues for us? Uh, there's been growing evidence supported by supported energy supply chain is vulnerable to uh, climate change in disaster events. Now, we've all seen images of corrupt, harmful powered lines along during wind and winter storms. Now, the once in a lifetime events like the Black Friday tornado and July 11, 2004, massive thunderstorms that hit Linwood and flooded the side streets and homes in our area. Um, Edmonton Journal reported that Alberta has three of Canada's costly 2020 weather events, including the storms across Central, including Edmonton, Southern Alberta, throughout July and August. Uh, these weather events are happening more often, and we believe EPCOR needs to be a leader in planning new infrastructures to deal with these threats as per the Sunday framework for disaster risk reduction. Finland, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick have power cables buried in the urban areas. We realize it is expensive to bury uh, power lines, but lowering risk will save money and disruption by creating more secure energy supply and decreased maintenance and repairs. So I hope you guys consider burying the lines on 100, well, the whole transmission line. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Deb Davidson. Good afternoon. My name is Deb Davidson, and I was born and raised in Edmonton, living in Linwood for almost 33 years and spending another 26 and living and working at times in the West End, so I'm fully familiar with the socioeconomic and other aspects of this area of the city. I'm going to refer to Councillor Hamilton's addendum for many of my remarks. On page five of the document is the Municipal Development Plan, Promote citizens' quality of life in the planning and development of high voltage lines. Represent the interests of citizens through consultation with the electrical energy supplier and providers and other jurisdictions and industry operators as they plan high voltage transmission lines and, if necessary, intervene with the regulators. Advocate that the high voltage transmission lines be buried when adjacent to residential neighborhoods. It's noted that EPCOR is not bound by this plan. Where was our advocacy? our representation. I would posit that as councillors, you are our representatives and you are employed by the city and therefore that you bear this responsibility. And since no intervention was made on our behalf, despite presentations made by community members and a petition signed by 630 out of approximately 728 Linwood homes to object or raise concerns regarding the project, you have failed in this duty. While I realize that being threatened by the legal department to have your ass kicked to the curb if you intervene was mentioned in one meeting is unsettling and is perhaps the reason that city administration did not receive instructions to intervene. The bureaucrats and legal department are not in charge of your dismissal. Ultimately, the voters are, and it's to us you owe a duty of representation. As to the cost to bury the lines from the metal arc substation to the White Mount, going with $2.9 million, plus or minus 30%, as an average value, and adding that to the $51.7 million total cost, it would be about a 5% increase. Going back to the addendum on page two, it refers to the fairness to other taxpayers of covering the cost to bury this section. I find this to be a specious argument, since the system we live under means that we all pay for improvements in all parts of the city, like the almost half a million dollars to put in and then take out bike lanes on 95th Avenue and other projects. Additionally, I believe the question was raised by a community presenter at one of the sessions 
As to why this construction wasn't combined with the West Valley Line construction on 156th and 84th Avenue, which is ongoing, but I don't believe an answer was provided, although, again, the document talks about the city being responsible for the cost of the overhead configuration that's underway, as it would not be necessary should the lines go underground. But there doesn't actually seem to be any sign of that going on yet. So another specious argument, unless, of course, EPCOR purchased everything because they had no intention of paying any attention to neighborhood feedback. Another question we asked was where else in the city these lines traveled next to a school, community playground, and playing fields or rinks, or were placed in front of homes. But again, despite our neighborhood being cited as a possible precedent center, no other currently existing site or proposed sites were provided. I want to pose a question to all of you on council. How many of you can honestly and sincerely say you would not object to a poll somewhere between 59 and 85 feet tall, between 7 to 10 feet around, being placed in front of your home? A poll carrying high voltage near your home, yard, and family. Poles that order your child's or grandchildren's schoolyard and playgrounds and sports fields. So while it's not all right to ask all taxpayers to share in the cost for burying the cable, it's okay for you to expect our community, and especially these homeowners, to absorb the loss in property value. I live on 84th at 152nd Street. I checked all the UPCOR lists. None of my neighbors on the avenue east of 153rd Street, men who have children going to the school and using the community playground, were consulted, despite EPCOR saying anyone within 300 meters would be consulted. But then that shrank to 200 meters, and then it shrank again. I realize that EPCOR exports have explained the way everyone's concerned about property value, noise, and EMF, but I personally found those responses dismissive and disrespectful. Our experts had differing opinions and perhaps erred on the side of our safety and health, knowing that things we once accepted as safe are now known health hazards. There is certainly nothing to indicate that any of this development enhances our health or quality of life. I've lived and walked near these kinds of lines, and they do make clearly audible noise. So while it and the substation may not exceed any accepted standards, that does not mean it doesn't affect the quality of life or some neighbors' health and comfort, depending on their personal tolerances of noise and vibration. As I said in my opening comments, I'm very familiar with this area of Edmonton, and I can guarantee that this project wouldn't be going ahead above ground in neighborhoods such as Valley View, Laurier Heights, Parkview, Crestwood, or Glenora. These neighborhoods are rife with judges, lawyers, doctors, and big business owners who would not stand for it and would have the political clout to be sure of being heard. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Councillor Andrew Knack, who became my go-to guy for help in any matters when they had difficulty contacting our councillor, and I noticed that he at least tried to make an intervention. To those of you who are leaving council, I want to thank you for all of your work. To those of you who may be thinking of running again, some of you need to up your representation, accessibility, and communication gains, or you'll find yourself at the curb. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davidson. Uh, next is Gail Spencer. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, and all participants. Yes, my name is Gail Spencer. My husband's name is Kim Spencer. What we would like to do, first of all, is just give you four numbers. Um, that the first one being uh, 1.5 meters. That is the di the diameter of these poles, these intended poles. 26 meters. That is the height of these poles. 3.5 meters. That is the distance between the pole and the edge of of uh, our property. Five meters is the distance between the pole and the official uh, edge of our property, that being the property line. We, uh, as, I, as you know, we are on the Elmwood portion of the proposed uh, transmission upgrade project. We are between 170th Street and 159th Street. Um, that is the the line is running directly adjacent to our property, and when I say adjacent, that's where the numbers come in. Three point five meters away from the property that we maintain, and five meters away from our official property line. My husband Kim has lived in our home in Elmwood for thirty years, and I have lived in our home for fifty three years. 
Our home and the land it sits on is the largest investment we have ever made or ever will make. We have worked hard all our adult lives to have this home and to be able to live on our property in good health, in safety, and with the financial security of selling our home at fair market value. Having the proposed tower so close to our property would end our life as we know it. Never again would we feel safe in our home or our yard. If we were to invite you to a barbecue in our backyard, you wouldn't be comfortable coming. You wouldn't be comfortable bringing your children. Um, No one is going to want to come to our property and sit five meters away from a noisy, unsightly tower that is 1.5 meters in diameter and 26 meters high. That's For those of us still, still in Imperial, that's 85 feet high. The lines will have 72,000 volts of electricity raining down on anyone in our, in our backyard, on our property, etc. Anytime we enter or exit our garage, load or unload a vehicle, perform yard maintenance and clean up in the alley, we will be directly under those lines. When we enter or exit our backyard or the back door to our house, we will see and hear the proposed lines. When we are in our bedroom, bathroom and kitchen, we will have no choice but to see the towers. Simply put, we will not be able to escape the towers. The physical and psychological toll will be all-consuming. If the upgraded line is installed above ground, our property values will plummet, making it next to impossible for us to sell our homes at fair market value if we can sell them at all. It is not lost on the residents along 79A Avenue that since 1964-65, We have maintained our properties and paid our property taxes, yet we are being asked to accept the archaic technology of of above, sorry, above ground towers, while citizens moving into new communities where all their services are buried. They do so without having paid a nickel in property taxes in that community. Shouldn't all tax-paying landowners be treated equally? I have knocked on the doors of over 175 homes in Elmwood and spoken directly with far more than 100 residents. In most cases, it was mom and dad, husband and wife, so, you know, just double that number. Overwhelmingly, the residents within the 200-meter zone of the proposed project were more than concerned about the impact this project will have on their lives. We're talking health, we're talking quality of life, we are talking um, property values. My next-door neighbor has two young ones, a one-year-old and a three-year-old. They moved, and there's going to be more. Thank you. Um... Oh, I'm sorry, Mayor Iveson. I'm not quite finished. I just had to turn the page. Well, we're, we're at the five minutes, so if you've got a closing uh, sentence. I do. Thank you. My husband and I are born and raised Albertans. That makes us born and raised Canadians. There are many things that Canadians are known for around the world, such as fairness, equality, inclusivity, and the list goes on. But what we are really known for is doing the right thing. This above-ground power line is not the right thing. I would expect to see an industrial installation of this type placed in a residential setting in a third-world country, but never in Canada. Okay, Surely, Ms. as Canadians, Spencer, we can do better than this. That's five we really sentences. I've got to the stop you there. to have our voices heard. Spencer, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Samantha Balzer. Hi, excuse me. Hi there. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samantha, and I'm speaking on beha- behalf of myself, my wife Megan, and our toddler. We've been living in Linwood for two years, um, and our home is on 157th Street. The backyard overlooks 156th Street. Um, we chose this neighborhood 
during our extensive house hunting that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Um, if you think back to, to growing a young family, you'll remember that house hunting procedure. Um, we selected this neighborhood because it's a mature established neighborhood with neighborhood amenities to support a growing family. Um, and we know that the city of Edmonton really values the support to those mature neighborhoods um, and is doing all kinds of work to support urban density in all kinds of ways. Um, we were excited to move into this neighborhood and to live along um, to live along a street that is safe for our child and you know future children to to grow up on. We've had visions of our child walking along the busy street with all of the neighborhood kids who cross from the west end of 156th Street. They pass our house every morning on their way to school. Um, and once these power lines, if they if they go up, um, exist, you're going to be watching dozens and dozens of children every day crossing the street under these immense power lines um, along with all of the all of the impact on um, those growing lives that some of our great speakers have already attested to. Uh, I hope that the impact of growing the city beyond the Hende and continuing those the westward expansion in particular isn't brought to bear as an undue burden on our mature neighborhood because as the city says, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm a social media user. Uh, all the time we see announcements about the, the work that the city is doing to support these urban environments. I know, I mean, one of the long-term plans that we had when we purchased our home is to um, um, add some space for our aging parents and further increase uh, the density of the neighborhood through a garden suite in particular. Those plans are dramatically impacted by the construction of these um, power lines. Um, so really, I guess the take home message I want to be giving um, to you as you consider the um, opportunity to bury these power lines is that um, is that our mature neighborhood should not be bearing the burden of outward expansion in the city. We shouldn't be the ones um, um, who are held responsible for that, especially as the city speaks all over about the, um, the work that they're doing to support um, that mature neighborhood growth. I think it's wonderful for the city to be doing things like, like committing to um, um, a million trees in mature neighborhoods, um, but trees are going to be cut down to make way for this power line, um, along with all kinds of other um, catastrophic impacts on daily life for, for young families who are committed to remaining in mature communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Balzer. Next is Megan Farnell. My apologies. Megan is my wife, and she's not able to speak because, um, because she's with our toddler. Oh, okay. Understood. Well, if that changes before we're done hearing from speakers, let us know. But um, thanks for letting us uh, in on that. Next, then, will be Susan Kreller. Thank you for letting me speak on this. I'm speaking on behalf of Linwood. Uh, one of our thing, one of our people is lives on 8312 156th Street in the house he bought 30 years ago with his wife and two dogs. They're directly across from Linwood Hall in the playground. The proposed transmission lines would clearly be visible and a sore spot looking across from their house. At present, they enjoy beautiful views. To the west, they have a small park, and to the east, we have mature trees and playground. These views and, quiet, and our quiet neighborhood are the main reasons we love living here. The proposed transmission lines would ruin these views in the sense of being respectable, quiet neighborhood. In essence, it would betray the main reasons they bought the home. They're nearing retirement age and was looking forward to spending more time around the house in this neighborhood, spending it listening to noisy construction with the resulting aberration is not the way they wanted to end their life in Linwood. Because their house is older and on a feeder road and bus route, we know many potential buyers would pass on buying their house. 
If the transmission lines go in as proposed, it would compound this and drastically affect how quickly they could sell their house. Also, should a developer wish to tear down the house and rebuild, the property would not be attractive, would not be an attractive acquisition with transmission lines across the streets. They have worked hard to maintain their house and have tried to be a good neighbor, taking care of their property, reporting crimes, picking up litter, and they even invested $10,000 in their home renovations. They believe that the transmission lines pose a serious health and safety risk. Whether EPCOR and the city believe this true or not is irrelevant because most people believe it is. As a result, many would not consider buying our property or many of our neighbors' properties. It is a well-known fact that a product like this reduces property values significant due to illness. They lost their dual income that they enjoyed many years. They cannot afford to take another financial hit that would result from this project, not to mention our many neighbors up and down 156 who will be similarly affected. This project, if it goes ahead, will negatively affect so many people, people may never completely recover. For most in the area, their homes are their biggest investment, something they're counting on. Other factors such as the economy or real estate market can affect property values but none of us were counting on or can afford a project like this hurting us. For the last several months, there have been a lot of construction on our street. We were asked to keep the water running in our house 24 seven for three weeks. There has been no parking in front of our house. There has been construction noise so loud it shook the house. This is inconvenience is part of living in the city and we have no complaints for that. Everyone is doing their part. However, because this is a viable option to bury the transmission lines, it's only right, only fair to pursue this option. It's what a good neighbor would do. Basically, EPCOR has not been honest with us either. Okay. They've not been good for our community. It's not good for the playground that it's around. Um, they have been very, EPCOR has been dishonest. There's, they are doing things in secret. Had it not been for David, we would never have known about this, but because David worked for EPCOR, it just showed us a lot of stuff that they were doing behind our backs. So this has been really very, very, it's awful. It's not adequate and it's not he healthy or happy for our whole community. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kreller. Um, Sharon Bytel. Is Sharon Bytel there? I believe that uh, they're participating by phone. It looks like they've just unmuted. Go oh, ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. And I'd like to thank the executive committee for this opportunity to speak. My name is Sharon Bytel, and I live in Linwood. Many of the residents of Linwood went through the Alberta Utility Commission hearing process. We attended the AUC information session and we were encouraged to submit statements and participate in the hearing so our voices could be heard. There are 728 single family homes in Linwood and over 630 people signed a petition opposing these high voltage area lines. During the AUC hearings, we heard the testimonies and opinions of experts both for and against the area lines. At the end of the day, the cost was the mitigating factor and the Alberta Utilities Commission ruled in favor of EPCOR and the high voltage area lines. Edmonton City Council has approved many progressive and innovative projects for the citizens of Edmonton and allowing high voltage area lines in front of schools 
or taxpayers' front yards is not a legacy many would support. We understand and support the need for increased electricity, but Linwood is the only community who will bear the impact of these lines in front of some people's homes, our school, our community league, and playground. $2.9 million for the lines to be buried underground along 84th Avenue and 156th Street is not an unreasonable cost. I would ask that the executive committee members support our community's request to bury the lines as per the bylaw 15100 of the municipal development plan. With all due respect, I would also like to ask the committee members to think about how you would feel about high voltage aerial lines installed in the front of your homes, on your front lawns, or in front of your children's schools and playgrounds. And I would also like to thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you to all of our speakers. Um, were there any other uh, folks who had registered along the way who were missing or who have joined us partway through? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, then we'll, uh, we'll turn to questions. But before we do that, I'll recognize that uh, Councillor uh, Knack and Councillor Katarina ha had joined us uh, earlier during... Um, well, actually, uh, right at the beginning of this, so I think they've heard uh, most of what's been presented, if not all of it. Uh, Councillor Nack certainly has, and I saw Councillor Katarina earlier. I see Councillor Henderson has joined us as well. Are there any other members of council observing? Just as I didn't acknowledge them at roll call, my, I'm out of practice. Apologies. I'm here, Mr. Just this guy. Uh, oh, Councillor Paquet and Councillor Essinger as well. So, strong turnout. Thank you all for uh, joining us for this. Um, wanted to make specific reference to Councillor Nax only since he had been mentioned. But uh, um, but uh, that done, we'll now turn to questions from members of committee first. Councillor Hamilton, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who came out today. Um, certainly my office and Councillor Nax's office has heard a lot about this issue over the past few years. The first question I had, um, and it's in reference to a comment made by Ms. Kammer, but I'm going to direct it towards David Arnold because you're cited in the uh, AUC decision um, uh, uh, on, on something that she mentioned, which is that sh uh, Ms. Kammer mentioned that there were sparse notes and that uh, there was some sort of confusion around the city's preferred configuration. Uh, and Mr. Arnold, you, you in fact, at one point during the hearing mentioned that um, there is some contradiction on what's going, sort of what the city's intention is or in policy and bylaw and then what, this, what sort of the secondhand notes are saying. Could you speak to that a little bit more? Uh, I'm not really uh, up to speed with your question as to uh, what, what is sparse and what's missing. Okay, well, perhaps Ms. Cameron would like to speak to that a bit because she she mentioned that as well, obviously, that there were um, sparse notes um, secondhand, delivered secondhand on the city's preferred configuration. Um, so perhaps you could elaborate on that, Ms. Cameron. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Yes, it was part of our submission. Documents were um, gathered together by our solicitor, Debbie Bishop. And I can obtain where we, they had asked for written submissions. And as part of the delivery of the written submissions as to why these decisions were made, those documents were made as part of the package. And I can obtain them and send them to city council if you wish. Uh, do you recall if they were authored, were they, were they notes like minutes taken from a meeting or were they, was it like a letter presented on letterhead? Um, could you give some context for what kind of documents we're talking about? From my understanding, it was notes of minutes from meetings that were held and for, with the Distribution and Transmission Inc. had a meeting with uh, a city contractor who basically didn't want to do this because it was going to be inconvenient. And I was also told from our solicitor that uh, part of it was uh, the city thought it might uh, be detrimental to the um, corridor because it, it could make it uh, less stable if we put these big towers in. But I think in my mind, it would make it more stable on the 
uh, roadside of white mud because they will be built with a substantial anchors, anchors to put it together. So um, anyway, I can obtain those documents and my understanding were they were actually notes of minutes that were submitted as part of the written submissions. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to run out of time shortly. Um, Ms. Vitel, uh, just so you can unmute, um, I have a question for you. Um, the last time we spoke, it was about this role of the city as an intervener, correct? Ms. Vitel, Sharon? There you are. Uh, are you, so the last time we, I don't know if you heard the question, the last time we spoke was about the role of the city as an intervener, correct? I think you may have just muted yourself again. So I was at the meeting with, with uh, Sharon yeah. Bartell at City Hall with her. So uh, on that second visit that we had with you, okay. uh, we had asked the city to act as an intervener on the basis of the bylaw, 15100, yes. Yes, that, and that wasn't a really great conversation, was it? That wasn't a great conversation, but you did provide the letter of support. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, that wasn't my finest hour as a, as a pol in this office by far. <laughs> but um, one of the things that I pulled out in the report, and Ms. Vitel, you can answer this, or Mr. Arnold, was that the city says that 150 members of the public um, had registered as interveners and that they felt that additional registration of the city would not make an impact and would in fact be a duplication of the, of your efforts. Do you agree with that statement? Do you think the city registering as an intervener would have made no impact and been a duplication of your efforts? I don't believe that at all. I believe that you would have had a great impact. Equo is owned entirely by the city and to have its principal shareholder sitting in opposition to a proposal I think would have had a great impact. Yeah, I, I'm out of time. Oh, oh okay, sorry, I'm Go on ahead. the line as well. My name is Sharon Bytel and, and I agree having uh, either yourself or Andrew Knack register as interveners would have been a, a great asset, and I think your word would have carried a lot with the Alberta Utilities Commission panel and uh, with EPCOR. And I, I, I don't, well, I can ask administration. I don't think we could have, Andrew or I could have registered as interveners, but we certainly could have asked the city to. Um, uh, but I'm out of time, so I'll leave it if there's other questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Are there other questions for the panelists? Maybe, maybe I'll jump in on that, um, I guess, to, to Ms. Bytel. So it is, it is your view that this, you think the city could have influenced a different outcome here? I mean, we could debate that, but that is your, that is your, your belief. That, that is my view, absolutely. I believe that. And so that is part of the premise of asking the city to remedy the situation by... Um, rather than what should have happened in your view, uh, where, where the rate payers across the province would, would cover the costs. Uh, in this case, the remedy is to the city uh, for what you perceive to be a, a, an error on the city's part in terms of not intervening in a way that, uh, that you think would have changed the outcome. I wouldn't really say that it was an error on the city's part. I just think that perhaps the outcome might have been different. And, um, you know, the whole Alberta Utilities Commission process, the hearings and everything, was a very expensive process. And I think, you know, some of that money, I mean, although it's out of a separate pot, I think some of that money could have been used a little more wisely, um, you know, for, to, I mean, put towards the cost, the cost of burying the line. And I, I certainly hear that that argument and and the frustration of many of you who've spoken with that regulatory process. Um, uh, it it is uh, this. It's, it, it's a lengthy difficult. process, and when you get lawyers involved and all of the expert witnesses, even though our law firm. Um, 
um, our law firm and Elmwood's law firm and 190th Street shared the cost of the expert witnesses, the costs were very excessive. Well, and, and to be honest with you, I think those are some of the reasons why the city is cautious about where we engage in these processes, uh, as even as an intervener, because they are they are heavy footprint uh, uh, processes. So that I, I'm not suggesting that's the the case in this instance, um, but but I certainly hear that frustration too. Um, but but I guess at the end of the day, um, that decision was not in the city's hands, it was in the AUC's hands. Perhaps you, you might have hoped EPCOR might have applied for something differently, and perhaps you might have hoped the city might have intervened, and perhaps you might have hoped the AUC would have agreed with you, but at, at the end of the day, we're here because none of those things happened. Absolutely. Okay. So then, this, that, that puts the city in a bit of a bind now. And, and I'm sure you've all read the report, um, and, and maybe I'll go to Mr. Arnold, since, since you've done some of this kind of work, I'm sure you've thought through these questions of equity that are flagged in the report about who then should pay. I mean, I, I think certainly if there's a case to be made they should have been buried, then, then it follows that, um, that that should be picked up by the rate base. That option's not before us now. So the fallback option is, is uh, that Edmontonians pick up the tab. Um, and, and so the, the other question that arises here is if we do that in this instance, uh, are we opening ourselves up? Uh, maybe, I'm not sure if it was you or if it was someone else who was arguing the issue of precedent set. Uh, the, the report speaks very clearly to the risk of a precedent for the city if we indicate, no, we'll, we'll undertake the cost to, to bury in the future. Uh, that that also sets a precedent, um, that it would be downloaded onto ultimately onto property taxpayers rather than the rate base. Do you do you see that as a, a valid concern? How do you trade off between the two of those, Mr. Arnold? <clears throat> well, I, I can see the uh, problems with setting a precedent of this type, but I was, I was also extremely surprised, actually, that EPCOR ever suggested placing an aerial transmission line on a residential street. I worked for ECOR for 28 years and we never ever did that while I was there. Now, <clears throat> I retired in 2010 and people have changed. I would have been ashamed if I had been at ECOR and this was proposed to the citizens of uh, Edmonton. But my thoughts on financing were that did you not receive a lot of make work money from uh, the federal government, which is what's funding the Tarawaga Drive um, improvements. Could that not some of that be used for this? The, the grants we receive from senior orders of government tend to be very specifically profiled to, to particular projects, and so they're not exactly portable to, uh, yeah. on a discretionary basis to, uh, to, the, to other the, projects. Yeah, as regards precedent, I mean, th this is... I worked at EPCOR for 28 years, and this is the first time that uh, aerial 72 kV lines have been built in uh, streets and avenues of the city in the, all that time. Uh, the transmission system was pretty good, pretty strong, and it wasn't needed. To go to an undergrad, to an aerial option, I think is disgusting. And... I personally, yes, it could be setting a precedent, but it's not going to be that common. Thank you. Uh, I'm out of time. Are there more questions for uh, our panelists here? Not seeing any. Then thank you all for your uh, submissions. I understand it's at the... Uh, you know, you've already interfaced quite a bit with public decision making on this, and I hear your frustration. So bear with us here as we pivot to some questions of city officials on this matter. I'll go to Councillor Hamilton to start. Thank you. Um, I mean, something that really kind of struck me we have on one hand 
in the report, the city has a principle in policy that utility projects are, are to be paid for by the rate payer. Um, and then at another time, we also say in the report that the MDP states in principle, but needs direction to follow policy. And I'm wondering why in one case, you know, when it comes to utilities and how we fund utilities, we have a, a, a principle in policy that we follow without question. And then on a, the other hand, when it comes to the MDP, which I thought would supersede um, other policies within the city within the city organization, why we would need to give administration direction to follow the policy of the MDP. Yeah, Councillor Hamilton, Ms. McCabe here. Uh, you know, it's a, a very good question that you ask and in terms of uh, what we've been doing through our review of policy and listening and learning is really understanding what the right level of detail is for policy. And you'll note that the new city plan, which was recently approved by council, doesn't have this level of detail in it because we've learned that putting this level of detail in a policy document such as the MDP doesn't create trust with the public. It also doesn't have the right implementation tools as we, um, as we transition uh, from uh, the higher level vision right down to the capital and operating budgets as well as the utility budget. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and you and I have discussed that right level of detail question um, before. Uh, but the, I guess, and this is, I think, more of a question, maybe a, a, a question statement. Um, you know, I, I was really surprised. In fact, I was, I would say, I was shocked by the statement that the city acting as intervener would be a duplication of the efforts of residents. And I, I would wager that um, we only heard from a few of them on that, but I would wager that uh, you know many of them would would argue that in fact it would not be a duplication. It would have really shored up um, not only their arguments, but the position of the city. Um, and I would, I, I'm just curious why the city felt that would be a duplication. Uh, we, why the city felt that their involvement wouldn't be, wouldn't be of value. Councillor Hamilton, it's Ms. Andrzejczyk. Based on our experience with other um, AUC cases, municipalities are not granted special intervener status in these circumstances, so we are one voice when it comes to the rooting or the underground issue, um, where we would be able to have greater influences in the Section 17 um, application, which is what they referenced in their decision, if we had um, agreed to pay for the underground lines and have a mechanism to either recover or um, allocate the costs. All right, thank you. Um, I think that oh, uh, Ms. Balzer made a, Balzer, I'm sorry if I, I mispronounced your name there. I think she made a really interesting point that something in our utility principles is around uh, uh, the, the rate payer pays the, the appropriate level of cost of the service. And yet, I think she made a really interesting point that um, we ha are at risk here of the mature neighborhoods bearing a cost of outward expansion. Um, is there any thoughts on on that, that the the financial cost might not be the only cost that is being borne at this time? Sorry, Councillor Hamilton, can you re-ask the question? Yeah, the... The, my question was that we had a speaker who talked about mature neighborhoods bearing the cost of outward expansion. And while we have a principle in utilities that uh, the rate payer pays the cost of the capital, we have a circumstance here where residents feel that they are paying an undue cost of outward expansion, that our mature neighborhoods are bearing the cost of, of outward growth. Yeah, Councillor Hamilton, uh, Ms. McCabe here, I think, think we understand the question here. I think that the nuance here that's really important to remember is that it's really based on the AUC decision about whether or not to bury it. Uh, and the AUC decision takes into a number of different factors and they are an independent board uh, free of political interference in, in their decision making. And I, 
that is what EPCOR is upholding here is that AUC decision. All right, I'm, I'm out of time. Councillor McKean. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've been listening intently to this and, and I realize this is very complex and very technical and, and, um, and the ask here is to cross jurisdictional lines and fix uh, something that uh, another decision maker made. But um, a, a couple of questions that'll help me. First of all, do we have this type of transmission line in the city that is within that close proximity to playgrounds and to residences? We do have someone from EPCOR on the line who could probably answer that question. So, uh, so this is David Arnold. Uh, I used to work for EPCOR. I'm, and I'm sorry, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Mr. Arnold. The, the, I'm sorry, sir. The, the time to hear from speakers has, has passed. So um, if there's a representative, a current representative, um, with all due respect, sir, uh, from EPCOR who, who can answer that question on the line. Good afternoon, Councillor McKean. My name is Teresa Crotty Wong. I'm with EPCOR. Uh, I, I have at hand some information about uh, the placement of transmission lines, and I can confirm that we do have some transmission lines running through residential neighbourhood. I don't have at hand information about where they cross uh, parks and playgrounds, but uh, I suspect I can get that to you in a matter of minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you for that. And it would actually be interesting to know how long ago those transmission lines were put in. Put in. Um, because it's a new day, um, and um, I'm very taken by the uh, submissions of the residents and the impact on their lives of this. Um, precedent is an interesting question, and it might have been Mr. Arnold who said, if so, uh, these circumstances might come up infrequently. Do you have any thoughts on that, <clears throat> uh, Ms. McCabe, or even uh, our representative from EPCOR on to whether or not there are future plans that would be like this? Transmission lines going into or adjacent to residential properties. Potentially, I would need EPCOR to speak to the details of their long-term planning. Yeah, and I'm not aware of any um, to pl plans over the next few years for additional transmission lines going into residential neighborhoods, but I, I do stand corrected. Uh, but as it stands right now, no plans. Thank you. Ms. McCabe, <coughs> sorry to put you on the spot, but uh, our new uh, plan the major planning document for this city uh, for the next 30 years or so, I think talks about creating vibrant urban places. And um, to me, that should be done equitably. Um, does this not fly in the face of that goal? Councillor McKean, I think that's a really challenging one. Um, in terms of, I think that you have to be careful on the governance perspective that AUC, which is an independent body, has um, has weighed into this decision already, and that the level of policy detail and design specifications would need to be updated through the city plan. So I'm not giving you a direct answer on that, but I'm saying that I think that that's a challenging space to weigh into. Yeah, and I, I apologize. It wasn't really a fair question to ask you. It's more of a was a political question that we have to decide whether or not uh, taxpayers in Edmonton should uh, write what I think was a wrong decision by AUC. Um, but uh, at any rate, I will continue to listen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walters. So the and and so thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I didn't have any. Uh, questions for you necessarily, but I, I did appreciate your submissions and and do uh, understand the uh, uh, 
displeasure with uh, the proposal. I think the person who asked us whether any of us here would like that out their back alley is, is always a fair question because the answer would probably be not. Uh, but notwithstanding uh, my personal opinions here, I, maybe Ms. Andrzejczyk or Ms. McCabe, uh, you could answer. You know, I, the a, whether the AUDC, AUC decision was wrong or not is, you know, sort of a, t a tough judgment <laughs> to make from where we sit, not having sat through what are much more extensive hearings than we would have been privy to at, at any point. Uh, it does say in the report that AUC considered the visual impact of the overhead lines as well as property value, health and safety and environmental considerations in arriving at its decision, uh, you know, and so on, uh, and that that decision was in the public interest. And then it talks about attachment three, but it only talks about the submissions from the residents, not any further uh, kind of rationale for why that would be, maybe the allocation of public interest is what I'm trying to understand. They, it's in the public interest in terms of providing necessary electricity to people f in further, air, you know, in the, f you know, outlying regions of Edmonton. Uh, but how much does it allocate or deal with the public interest to the people who intervened? So thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Walters. And I'll probably ask Ms. Uh, Crotty Wong to add to it because, um, of course, EPCOR would have been much more involved in the process and the arguments. Um, but the way I understand is they look at the public interest broadly across Alberta, um, not just that local community. Certainly they would hear all the interveners and give them status and hear their issues, but they would look at a number of criteria, reliability, you know, safety, um, and, and all of those aspects to it as well. Um, and my understanding is it is... Um, not that common to have underground transmission wires. Um, and I believe in the Heartland. So not that common. No, right. in, in the Heartland AUC hearing, we did intervene as a city to propose underground lines and we ended up with the same result. But presumably AUC operates with some degree of historical evidence that if a project was to have a very serious economic impact via reduced property values or health, health and safety impact, that that would be applied uh, more severely than just to say, well, the, it's, it's okay for you to suffer a little bit here because this has broader public interest implications to the net positive across the province. They wouldn't necessarily allow a project to proceed if there was anything dire to occur to the interveners. So property values and health and safety are considered, and they were in this case. I don't, I, I'm not familiar with a large group of AUC hearings. Perhaps um, Ms. Crotty Wong may have a little bit more information to assist you there with that question. Sure. When, when a project is brought forward to the AUC, the AUC has a mandate uh, under its uh, statute to think about social, economic, and environmental impacts. And those are the three pillars that really inform uh, whether or not a project is within the public interest. And within those three pillars, um, you know, the cost of the project, health impacts, um, visual impacts, property value, those are all things that are considered. And in this proceeding, those, those matters were put forward to the AUC for their consideration and review. And on the other side of all of that analysis and a two week hearing, the AUC determined that this project, as proposed, um, met their public interest test. Right, and they're a very old and mature organization in, in the province in terms of dealing with this. So I guess just in terms of the, you know, how these are, are um, uh, I guess, uh, divvied up, uh, that, if that's the right way to say it, in terms of, well, it's clear that the public interest is there for people who are going to be users of the energy right and uh but they're not going to uh, you know um over privilege that portion of the public interest to someone else's like and i don't know if dire is the right word but if, if they could prove that someone's property value like home becomes unsellable they wouldn't just say well that's you know too bad so sad there's some degree of evidence or measure that they apply to those decisions is what i'm trying to understand presumably 
Yeah, that, that's my understanding as well. If there was evidence that demonstrated that um, there was going to be a, a negative impact, um, whether it's property value or health impacts, then the commission wouldn't be in a position to determine that the project was in, a public, in the public interest. Okay. Oh, I see I'm out of time. I might come back a little bit more on that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I just had one question. Something that came up uh, from the speakers and shows up in the AUC report as well is some confusion around the city's own standing in terms of, or the city's own opinion, I would say. Um, at one point, we have a speaker who is talking about the MDP and the role of the MDP. And then we had a speaker today who spoke about sort of sparse notes um, delivered secondhand on the city's behalf via EPCOR. So I was wondering if the city submitted directly any documents that provided clarity to the AUC in terms of the city's own position on the high voltage transmission lines. Councillor Hamilton, uh, not that I'm aware of through the process. All right. I um yeah and and I I have some concern that any sort of that many of the sentiments of the city's city were delivered through EPCOR not because I have a problem with EPCOR but because the city has a very complex relationship with EPCOR we are the shareholder as well as the regulator um, uh, so uh, that that to me it strikes me as problematic. Um, anyways, I will, I will have more to say. We have an attached motion to this, uh, a funding motion, and I'll have uh, more to say on that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Councillor Walters? So who, whoever wants to take a crack at this, just to go back to the, you know, focus more on the, on the property values question. Is there some sort of formula or, or measure that they use specifically in their in AUCs in their written submissions after they've heard from interveners to say that you know it's okay if your property values fall by five or ten percent I'm being a bit arbitrary here just to illustrate the question but it's okay for your property values to fall a little bit and then it remains still in the broader public interest and once it falls a certain amount that the weight of public interest changes to to the interveners, is there like I just want to understand that a little bit more because I'm just looking to see if Ms. Crowdy Wong Ed has an can, answer, if she can get us one. I'm not that familiar with if they have a formula or a calculation that they use when determining the public interest, which is part of their mandate. Uh, Council Walter, there isn't a formula, but I can say that with this hearing, uh, there was expert evidence that was provided on behalf of both EPCOR uh, as well as the Linwood community, and you know, I'm just not sure if that included the other communities as well, but certainly there was information from two experts that did an evaluation as to the potential um, uh, impacts on property value with the transmission line, and uh, the Commission had determined that there was no um, uh, no, no, no impact um, that would uh, indicate that the project was not in the public interest. So no, no impact that would determine that the project wasn't in the public interest, but was there indication that the property values per home in that direct area would reduce as a result uh, of the project, even though it may still be in the broader public interest? Uh, you know, I didn't review the... Um, expert evidence in advance of this uh, in advance of this meeting but from memory I believe that certainly our expert the, the opinion was that there was no impact on property value okay because I you know I compare this to the debate that we'd often get into about cell towers where if it's right across the street from your house it has a impact on your property value for sure uh, but it's certainly in the broader, it's in the public interest for everybody else in the, in the neighborhood and in the, in the catchment area. So these are tough questions, I think. Uh, but um, I'll just leave it there. I think that's all I have on that. Thanks. If I could just uh, perhaps comment, Councillor Walters, just on that. I, I think um, my understanding how they work is that it's, it's the overall public interest. And not only is it what they do, I would say it's their responsibility to absolutely consider all those things. I'm talking they, the AUC, when, when on balance they figure out 
in their opinion, if it's in the matter of public interest. But that is their core responsibility in this entire decision. I think that's an important to point out because that means they have to consider everything, uh, property values, every submission they would have got from all those um, folks who, who were part of the process, and that is their core responsibility. So I think that's important to note. Okay, thank you. Councillor Carmel. Thank you. Just a couple of uh, quick questions. Uh, it seems to me we have had other power lines, elevator power lines built in the city relatively recently. There was one on 99th Street, I think. Does anybody recall for sure? Like these do happen from time to time. and They, they do may... happen from time to time, that's correct. And do we know of any future ones or any, any others that are potentially coming that as we build reliability in the grid and upgrade the electrical systems that serve the region? Uh, Epcor had indicated in a previous that not at this point. I'm sorry if I missed that. Yeah. Uh, and there was some discussion earlier about, um, you know, that as the city grows, those core neighborhoods tend to feel the impacts. We see this in other ways too. Our roadway network, for instance, uh, you know, those core roads that uh, see more and more impact as the city gets farther and farther away, but, but people that are traveling uh, from those distant neighborhoods through the more established neighborhoods, neighborhoods feel those impacts. That's correct. So this is not unprecedented necessarily from that perspective that as a city grows, those neighborhoods that have been around the longest are going to feel perhaps the impacts the most. Perhaps. I think that growth impacts neighborhoods in different ways. It can be a beneficial thing if perhaps that neighborhood coffee shop has enough people now in order for that neighborhood to be able to support that neighborhood coffee shop. So with growth, there's always many trade-offs. Right. Okay. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, other questions for administration? And really that's cross-referenced on both. Uh, motions? Councillor Hamilton? Yes, um, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, oh, that's um, right, yeah. Yeah, uh, we have a motion on the floor to resolve this. I mean, first of all, do you want me to receive 7.2 for information or do you want me to deal with 8.1 first? Uh, let's receive 7.2 for information. That's a good suggestion. I'll move that. Thank you. Um, since we're going to get into the discussion on 8.1, uh, we can wait for then. So, unless anyone wishes to speak on the receipt of information of 7-2, the inquiry specifically, not seeing any, then please vote. We have all the votes, Mr. Mayor. And uh, display the vote, and that's carried. Okay, so um, I'm trying to remember, was the motion referred here? Yes, it was. Okay, so that is on the floor for discussion here, but uh, uh, would need to go back to council. Uh, either with a recommendation to so the question that's before committee today is whether what and whether to recommend any particular course of action to council for council's consideration next week so the motion so the motion on 8 one is not really on the floor before us today it's a report sent to us by council containing that motion which is, strictly speaking, on the floor before council next week. So what we can do is, is uh, debate um, uh, a specific recommendation in, in respect of that motion. So that would be a fresh motion. I see, uh, well, I'll go to Councillor Hamilton first, and then uh, Councillor Knack has clicked on as well. Councillor Hamilton. Um, so I, I introduced this at council uh, before, so I don't want to repeat myself, but we uh, have heard a robust input from the neighborhoods affected today. And I believe that the question that keeps getting put to us is that, um, or the statement that keeps getting put to us is that EPCOR 
that the city has no jurisdiction over EPCOR and it wouldn't have mattered if the city had intervened because we don't have any sort of special status with AUC. That, I think, is, that's not the reason I made this motion. The reason I made this motion is because the city made a promise to residents in the form of the municipal development plan that it would intervene. And at every step of the way, we fought that. And in fact, I'm sure Councillor Knack will have something to say about it, but I don't think he withdrew his motion uh, willingly uh, when that came to, to council in 2019. I recall that being a really difficult conversation, and he fought that quite a lot. I understand that there are utility precedents, or I should say utility policy, because we actually don't know if there's a precedent here. Um, there is utility policy that says that the rate payer should pay for uh, the, the utilities um, or the, the cost of capital construction. However, um, I think that the city did not live up to the promise of the municipal development plan when we didn't submit documents to the AUC to articulate our own position as a corporation on this, when we didn't feel that our intervention um, would make an impact and would be a duplication of residents' own, uh, own efforts. I, I, frankly, I read that and I couldn't believe that I was reading that because, um, as I think residents would agree, we we would have made an a impact. The city of Edmonton sitting at the table has a much different impact than than one or than than a resident uh, with an individual home. Um, not to say that they they don't make an impact, but I think it would have been of a different scale. Fundamentally, at the heart of this is that we made a promise to residents. We didn't live up to that promise. And at the opportunities we had to advocate for that promise, we didn't take it. I think it, you know, we would be having a different conversation if we had taken those opportunities to live up to that promise. And, and I think we disappointed a lot of people in that process. So I bring the capital profile forward. The capital profile isn't to fully fund it. The capital profile... Um, isn't to say that we will always do this. The capital profile is to say, let's see the numbers. Um, let's see what it costs for us to live up to that promise. And let's see if council supports that. And for that reason, I hope that committee will support council, This referring this back to council with their support. For it. So that's so your that's motion is to recommend uh, that the motion on the floor at council be adopted yes okay so that's that's before us and and uh now on debate on that recommendation so, so just a point of order mr mayor yeah the, what we're debating is so the motion is already on the floor at council it's over there correct waiting for us to arrive there Next Effectively, week. yes, right. we're not debating the motion. We don't have jurisdiction to amend right. the motion or so debate the motion, strictly speaking. So a report is right. here that contains the motion. Council sent it to us to um, to weigh the merits of, and then uh, and then we can recommend amendments. We can recommend that it be passed. We can recommend that it not be passed. We can make committee can make whatever recommendation we want. We just can't amend the motion or right. deal with the motion so directly here. The Only council is, can do that because it's on the floor at council. I guess my specific question is: that no matter what we recommend or don't recommend here, we're still debating. We will still debate the same motion at council. Correct. That, that, so it's almost uh, like doesn't doesn't matter that much what we recommend here. Not, not to suggest that our input isn't important, but it doesn't have an effect on the motion that's on the floor of council. Other than maybe just a little bit of, well. <laughs> well, we that can, is the theme of the day, is what do <laughs> interventions uh, add up to in the grand scheme of things? That's a governance question, yep. not a, yeah. Okay, uh, that's fine. Okay. Uh, so, so it is to the committee to make uh, a recommendation um, relative to the motion on the floor of council, if the committee so desires. 
and that is what council asked us to do was hear this matter um, though I don't I don't remember exactly what the referral motion was that's in the reports but I don't have that open in front of me was there were there specific instructions it was for the report to uh, for the motion on the floor to be dealt with at the same time as the report responding to the inquiry that that you just heard so this right motion, it was to cross-reference them and to yes. hear from speakers on the assumption we were getting here from speakers so really that work is done um, and and then um, it's to council to deal with the, the motion at council next week so so uh, but it is in order for a committee to make a recommendation on uh, on that motion on the floor it's not binding on council but it is in order okay uh, Councillor Knack. Well, first, sorry, Mr. Mayor, I, I do just want to make sure I double check that I th because the motion was, for, and maybe this is, doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things, but the, the motion I thought can in fact be dealt with by executive committee because the motion is to simply create a, a budget profile. And, and it didn't say, because I think we've referred motions to committee in the past to then come back to council and we've specifically said that. Whereas this one feels like it's within the jurisdiction of committee, and, and again, well, I suppose I suppose if count if it would be within the committee's jurisdiction to ask for a profile to be created, so that motion could be dealt with today. That hasn't been moved though, um, and then the recommendation could be for the redundant motion to be rescinded at council. So there is a pathway to get to there. However, typically when something is sent down by council, the assumption is it will come back up to council. So oh. we might get offside with uh, uh, eight or nine, eight of our colleagues if we were to do that. I will. I won't press it any further. I just. I wanted to double check because I thought it was technically within the purview of committee to to ask for a profile. But n nevertheless, it's coming to council. Uh, I, I will briefly speak then, if that's okay, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and, and I figure, it, even though it's going to come to council for a vote, it's worth speaking to right now, just since we have uh, residents who have taken the time to come uh, out and speak to this, and want to make sure they have the chance to hear from us. Uh, and first, just my thanks to all of them. I didn't have any questions, um, uh, in part because uh, Councillor Hamilton uh, did a great job of, of tackling all those questions. Uh, and also just my thanks to her for bringing this forward for discussion. Um, I, I appreciate, I also appreciate your comments throughout the, the debate, in particular when you introduced the motion. Um, this is one that I, I wish I had a do-over. Uh, when it came to how we manage this. And, and, and again, I'm going to point to myself just as much as anyone else on this. Uh, when this issue was first raised, uh, part of why I didn't want to get heavily involved at the start is because I didn't want to have to pick between which route was the right route because, frankly, they were both going through uh, residential areas in Ward 1, and I didn't feel it would be right for me to try and say this one is better than another because, understandably, residents from both uh, sets of neighborhoods had their own comments and, and inputs. So I, I didn't want to intervene in that sense. Uh, but the, the notion of the underground portion, I think, is really relevant. And, and when I did bring forward the, the motion to register it as an intervener, again, it was, it was a flawed approach in that it, I, I know it came at the 11th hour. I wish I would have done that earlier in the process because I think we could have had this type of robust conversation a little bit earlier. So I, I will, again, accept the blame on that of, of not having brought this forward at the right time. Um, so just to say that out loud, with that said, you know, we do still have this opportunity to have this discussion. And, and I think it is important for us to really weigh <laughs> at that point. Um, I do that. I usually make a lot of people cry. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, so I just, I wanted to say that I, I do think this is really important for council to discuss. And I appreciate that this motion, essentially what it does is it allows us and allows council to have a budget conversation at, at our next uh, supplemental capital budget adjustment. So approving this motion doesn't say you will absolutely do it. It says, let's make sure we get the final numbers and then council can have a yes or no say. But I, I, I hope we will uh, at least allow that conversation to occur. But, but uh, when it comes back, uh, be very thoughtful around uh, 
the value in doing this for some of those local neighbors. And, and again, I, I will even say up, uh, up front that it is a bit different in different parts of this line. There's a portion of this line that is going through the transportation utility corridor. There is also a portion of this line that is going right through some residential areas. Um, I live seven blocks south of, of sort of the substation, or sorry, seven blocks north of the substation. And so I'm not directly impacted, but I, I know having been in that area for almost 20 years that, that this is really important for those residents who came forward to speak. So I hope at a minimum committee will support recommending this to council and then council will end up supporting it at, to at least create the profile so we can have that budget debate. Uh, and, and I think the information today from the residents is quite valuable in helping to inform why we might want to consider this when the time comes, when that profile comes forward for actual debate. So um, thanks for everyone for, for the discussion. Thank you to Councillor Hamilton for uh, bringing this back onto the agenda. I shouldn't have withdrawn the motion when I did uh, back in 2019. It would have been better for us to have had that discussion there, but it's here now and, and thank you for helping to make that happen. So I encourage committee to at least support this to council and then hopefully for council to support everything. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Carmel. Thank you. So, uh, Mayor Everson, guide me if I'm out of step here on the process at this point. But was the intent of the motion made at Council, I guess this would be to the mover of that motion, that a budget adjustment would come back relatively immediately or come back to the spring uh, budget adjustment? I guess my question is, if it comes back to the spring budget adjustment, by that time there might be uh, foundations built and poles erected. Uh, so, it, I mean, I'm, I brought this forward on October, oh, it's November 16th, um, to that meeting. And at that time, I think I did say that it was, uh, I had wanted it to come sooner for the reasons that you're talking about. Um, I believe in the report, it does say that construction wouldn't start until July or August, 2021. So, a, so a spring budget adjustment might still be timely, but I can't speak to whether or not administration feels that way. Yeah, administration, there's a comment. So the challenge here is the designs are finished, and I believe in the report it indicates that the city would be responsible for the design changes as well. So we, I'm not sure if uh, Epcort is, uh, could speak to when we would need the decision made if there was going to be a change um, in that process to ensure that construction would not happen this summer. And I guess related to that is, are we talking about just the 150, I think the motion is just the 156th portion? Or does it include the white mud portion as well? Is that a question to me? I, I guess so, uh, Councillor Hamilton, because I, the motion as it's contained in our our, our uh, materials here does not is not specific. It just speaks to underground. Uh, in residential areas, per uh, the relevant sections of the bylaw, so that would I would need. I know there was some concern voiced by residents uh, that it didn't include their area. I would need to find some clarification from administration whether or not, for instance, alleyways would constitute a residential area. Because I I. I am pretty sure that work has, I'm pretty sure poles are up along the white mud, which would be the alley portion already. I think uh, no, that's the TUC portion, sorry. I think if it assists, Ms. Crotty Wong may have some information on any delay that EPCOR may have, but it's also important to keep in mind that we would still need an AUC decision as well. So yeah, I just thought I, I, I might add a couple of things. Um, so as, as although construction hasn't started along 156th Street, we are engaged in a number of pre-construction activities. Um, and so we, we propose to continue on with construction until the, uh, the city makes its decision once that decision is made. And we're, we're obviously here to support you in that process. Um, the other thing to consider, however, is that the longer it takes to make a decision, we're looking at a little bit of a delay here. And we expect that if you made the decision today, for example, we might have a delay in actually um, an in-service date for this project of between eight and 24 months. And, and this project has been uh, deemed as urgent and needed by the commission. Uh, we need to provide, continue to provide safe and reliable service uh, to uh, 
um, the, the residents and, and the businesses in that area. So we do have some concern about delay. So between the need to go back to AUB and make either a subsequent application or revised application and not quite knowing just how much of the alignment we're talking about and when you start getting into delays and the cost of work already done, that sounds like a bit of a moving target to establish a budget for consideration either immediately or at SOBA. Fair? That is, that is correct, Councillor. Um, we would be looking to evaluate and perhaps update these figures as a result of that. Attachment 1 does have the detail, if, due to a, perhaps a bit of lack of clarity on our part of what wants to be buried, we've got it segmented, and so you can see as we add on. But that was at a point in time. Precisely. Prior to construction almost completed in some places. Yeah. So, so as we build the profile, which would not be a capital profile, as it's not ours, it would just be a budget profile, um, we would uh, have to update those figures. It would be a grant. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I guess I'll speak to this. Um, this, is a, this is a tough one because, first of all, I'm very sympathetic hold on here I'm very sympathetic to the case that's been presented uh, to us here by uh, the homeowners and community members um, about what they believe their experience will be and and what their experience has been through this regulatory process and the public engagement that preceded it so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to all of that um, but even just now, we've heard that there are considerable trade-offs in the broader public interest around timeliness and in-service dates. And the, the most tangible question really back to, to us uh, is whether it is a good expenditure of an indeterminate amount of civic dollars uh, because of the design implications. This is, you know, in terms of our PDDM model, uh, this is... This is not at a, a shovel-ready checkpoint. So it is a pretty open-ended question what this would cost uh, to remedy these issues that have been uh, raised by folks who are affected by the AUC's decision to put these power lines in the air. Uh, and we, we have not heard all of the evidence uh, for why the application is what it is, nor seen all of the considerable submissions that would have gone to the AUC, um, which makes us a pretty poor court of appeal because we don't have all of the information that informed uh, AUC's determination before us here today. Um, and at the end of the day, the appeal really rests on the premise that uh, if the city had intervened differently, perhaps there would have been a different outcome. And I don't think there could have been a stronger case made for what the impacts will be than was made by the residents at considerable expense in, you know, a, a duly um, um, unfolded regulatory process. And uh, having sat through our own regulatory hearings uh, at Utility Committee, I have some understanding, uh, though I think the AUC's degree of complexity is probably a notch higher than what we deal with here, but of what those trade-offs are uh, and how difficult it is to make those decisions. And uh, so I can understand and, and certainly hear and respect the, uh, the fear and the anger uh, of folks who are concerned about this infrastructure uh, coming to, in some cases, their front lawns. And so I can understand how we got to here with uh, a proposal for the city to remedy that. And if there was a straightforward remedy to that, that didn't come at uncertain cost, and that didn't establish, I think, a very dangerous precedent that the civic taxpayer will begin uh, uh, to take on the cost of burying electricity infrastructure, which if it's justified should be borne by the customers uh, and rate pairs of, of the electricity system. Um, 
and and I would have felt strongly about that before all of the other challenges the city is facing right now. But I think opening that up, um, there may not be a short-term uh, other question coming before us, but when we think about the sort of mega trends of electrification as um, over the next generation that will be necessary in order to deal with some of the climate objectives that the, the city and, and, and beyond have, that's going to call for the enhancement of considerable uh, transmission and distribution capacity around, uh, around our community. And if the expectation will be at any point that property taxpayers will begin to bear those costs, we simply do not have the rate base sufficient to cover that along with the other things uh, that are properly our jurisdiction. So with great sympathy for uh, what certainly feels like a regulatory process failure to, to uh, the neighbors, uh, who are impacted by the decisions of the AUC. I cannot in good conscience uh, recommend today nor vote in favor at uh, council next week nor make a budget amendment uh, to put civic dollars into, um, into changing this outcome. Um, because if the AUC was not persuaded by what neighbors here had to say, I'm not sure what the city could have added that would have changed the AUC's decision is the assumption I'm forced to make, not having seen all of the evidence one way or the other. So that's a tough call, but I'm not going to be able to support the motion before us here. Uh, Councillor Walters. So I, I won't add much more to that, but just to, you know, get my perspective on the record for the folks that uh, took the time to, to be here today is, uh, it's, you know, I respect their their input, and, and certainly Councillor Hamilton's uh, advocacy and Councillor Nack's advocacy on their ha on their behalf, bringing this forward. I, I felt through this whole thing like we're in a way being asked to overturn or at the very least delay a AUC decision that uh, doesn't make me feel. I don't have a lot of confidence in our in our ability to do that correctly, considering the as as the mayor just outlined the process that AUC goes through is far more extensive than we could uh, at this committee. Uh, so yeah, sympathy isn't gonna, isn't gonna give you a lot, I, I suppose, to all the folks that have taken the time to speak today. But I, I do share it, I, I share your frustrations, but uh, I don't see how we could intervene uh, in any way at this point. Uh, and for that to be a wise on our part as a, as a municipal corporation. So I'll just note that for the record, thanks. Thank you. Any others wishing to speak? Councillor Hamilton to close. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Okay. Please vote on the motion to recommend that Council adopt the motion on the floor. We have five votes, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Display the vote. And that's defeated. And so, strictly speaking, that means no recommendation from committee, uh, though. So we have to put the motion in the affirmative the other way, uh, or we could requisition at this point might be the cleanest thing to do, and then for, uh, for, for council to pick it up from there. Requisition. To council. Same. Okay. So the, the item is requisitioned uh, and the motion will still be on the floor at council, but with the benefit of uh, everything that we've heard here today. So thank you everyone for your, uh, for your uh, patience and your attention. Um, let's pivot now. Well, wait a second. It's, uh, let, maybe we can get the presentation in. Is there a presentation on item six point? Sorry, wait a second. Which one would be next? I wonder if we could juggle the order here. Uh, so we've got six six and six seven were selected. We've got a six nine and seven one yet with um, um, with speakers. We could bring the ones with speakers forward potentially. Um, so uh, we could is uh, uh, so I need a motion then if we were going to do that to bring forward six point nine. 
next. Uh, I'll move that, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, um, Councillor Cartmel. I'll just see if there is any objection to bringing um, 6-9 forward. Not seeing any. Then I'll check to see if there's a presentation on it. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's Jason Leafsta speaking. We do not have a presentation for this one. Okay. Well, um, given that there may be questions of the speakers on this, uh, we could hear from them, but we'd be breaking it up over the break. So I'm going to suggest that we just take the break now. Uh, and then to Mr. Samji and Mr. Thiessen, uh, we'll come to you right at 3.45 once we uh, reconvene from our break, and then we won't chop up your... Uh, um, your presentations too too much um, and and we will ha you'll have our full attention because we will have attended to nature's imperatives between now and then so um, why don't we recess now and uh, we'll come back uh, let's aim for 345 sharp please
Welcome back. Um, um, I'll just roll call uh, again with members of council here. Uh, Councillor McKean. I am here. I see Councillor Cartmel. Thank you. Hello, Councillor Hamilton. Hello. Welcome back. Councillor Walters. Present. And uh, let me just see who's here from members of council. I see Councillor uh, Esslinger on the screen. Uh, and Councillor Katarina had been joining us earlier. You still with us, Councillor? Nope. Oh, okay. I thought he might be here for this one. But um, uh, any other members of council on the line? Councillor yeah, Henderson? I'm here. Hi there. Alrighty. Couldn't rip me away. <laughs> There's Councillor Paquette. Okay. Great. Well, that's plenty to get started again on this item. There's no uh, introductory... Uh, presentation so we'll work from the materials that are circulated ahead of time uh, but we'll now hear from our two speakers uh, on we didn't have a third one on this one did we yes we yes did, we do Mr. actually Wayne. I need a motion to add Elliot Fraser to uh, the delegation for item 6.9 I'll move that I'll just uh, check unanimous consent any objections not seeing any, then we'll hear from Mr. Samji, then Mr. Thiessen, then Mr. Fraser. You've each got five minutes. Stay on the line as there may be follow-up questions to you. So, Mr. Samji, welcome, and go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and uh, and uh, thank you all, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, councillors. Uh, we do appreciate uh, having things moved forward. Uh, uh, I'm not sure when we would get moved to, and I know you guys have a, have a lot on your plate today, so I certainly certainly appreciate it. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm here today speaking on behalf of uh, the Ramada Yellowheads uh, and our partners, uh, colleagues, and, and, and tenants at the property. Um, uh, this is for bylaw 19468, the closure of uh, access to titled parcels for the Yellowhead Trail. Um, for reference, uh, our parcel uh, where the hotel is is Schedule A2 in your in your documentation. Uh, and I I, I want to begin uh, just to, to to clarify, you know, from from our perspective, uh, you know, the, the goal uh, the goal of me speaking today is not to discuss the merits of of uh, the plan for for the Yellowhead Freeway, uh, you know, I I uh, understand that that's uh, you know I think the time for that is long past. Uh, you know, I, the the plan at some point is going to go ahead. Our opposition to this particular uh, bylaw, or or at least uh, the timing of it, is really more from a process perspective. Uh, for for those of you that are not familiar with the hotel, uh, we service largely a trucking clientele, uh, of which. The vast, vast majority come off of Yellowhead Trail, um, you know. And you know, if I, if I look at the precedent from from properties like ours, uh, when you know the Sands access from uh, Yellowhead Trail for the Sands was closed, uh, I know that you know they went through a similar process, and uh, you know the 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 truck traffic that you know they received, uh, which they no longer receive now, was was greatly impacted, and our concern. Uh, from from uh, from ourselves and, and from our tenants is that by closing vehicular access right now uh, before anything has been decided in terms of expropriation or in terms of compensation or how that process is going to look, uh, we don't want to be in a position where our livelihoods are getting affected, our abilities to pay our mortgages are being affected by having these access closures well in advance of uh, anything being firmly decided uh, with respect to what our future as as property owners and as as uh, as uh, business operators is, um, you know, unlike the sands, you know, regardless of uh, of what our access is right now, the nearest access is to me at 149th Street will be 156th Street and St Albert Trail. I'm basically mid block in between, about a kilometer each way of having accesses. Um, and we serve a largely blue collar trucking clientele, it will no longer be possible uh, or economical in any sense, in any, uh, in any sense uh, for, for truckers to, to come to visit our property. Um, and again, we understand that, you know, at the end of the day, the decision on what's going to happen at the Yellowhead uh, uh, has been decided and that process is being followed. Um, what we would respectfully ask is that, you know, 
on in a good on a good faith basis before any closure is made of the vehicular accesses that we have before my clients are no longer able to come to the hotel or no able to use our premises that we know what's going to happen and we have certainty in terms of how long our business is going to be there for and and what the future is going to be so you know, I can make sure that you know my tenants are looked after, my mortgage is taken care of, and that we have certainty in what this process is going to look like. You know, we recognize, uh, and it's certainly that I say again that this is going to happen. But the powers that this particular action grant, regardless of when the actual closure happens, uh, really gives us no control or certainty over what's what the future is going to look like. And uh, respectfully, I, I don't believe that's fair. And uh, I don't want our business and, and our livelihood put, uh, uh, put into, uh, into question uh, in a property we've owned since 2005 uh, without understanding what the future is going to look for. Our tenants, my colleagues look to us to, uh, to give them the information on, on what's going to happen to them. And I want to be in a position to be able to do so. And uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, the request I, I humbly make for you today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Samji. I'm sure there'll be some questions uh, for you, but stand Absolutely. by, please, as we hear next from sure. Mr. Thiessen. Mr. Thiessen? I believe he's just muted. Oh, you're muted, sir. Try again. There should be a microphone icon along the bottom of your screen that's red, and if you click on that, it should go white, and that will unmute you. There you go. I'm sorry. I I tell people that uh, my technology skills are like a grandparent, just not as good. Um, so I apologize. Uh, my name is John, and I'm uh, the um, general manager of Canadian operations for Danson's. Uh, and our facility is at 15110 uh, Yellowhead Trail. I want to say thank you for the opportunity to come and to speak to you and to share the concerns that we have regarding the closure of the access to our property. Um, so we have two accesses off of Yellowhead and one of them is recommended for closure. And uh, further to that, I want to say I understand the reason for, for the recommendation from administration. Uh, our concern is the safety of our customers and of our staff, uh, because what remains uh, is the only access that we have to our property is the access that's used uh, for trucking. And as a distribution center, uh, we have a good number of trucks coming and going every single day. And uh, so we feel like uh, that that's creating an unsafe environment for our staff and for our, our uh, customers when they come to visit our facility. Um, I want to uh, also express that uh, we have had the opportunity to meet with the planning committee. We did that last Thursday and, and have expressed our concerns to them. And they have, I believe, understood our concerns. And I, my understanding is that they are in agreement uh, with the safety concern for the, uh, again, the staff and the customer traffic. Um, so really our, our uh, intention today is not to uh, so much speak uh, against the closure because we understand why that has been recommended, but we uh, understand that if closure takes place, we're asking for relocation of that access. And so um, that's what we're requesting. And um, we, we think that's a good solution. I, I believe that administration or the uh, planning committee has agreed that they will um, look into that, uh, but we had already booked this um, opportunity to speak and wanted to take advantage of it so that it is officially on record that we um, are um, suggesting that relocation would be the solution to that problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
stand by uh, as there may be questions. And then next up is um, Elliot Fraser. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Thank you for taking the time to hear us today. I, um, I'll keep it short. I'm, I'm speaking in support of John Thiessen um, with Greystone Property Management. Uh, we manage uh, the property for Danson's. I think John has articulated um, our initial concern of, of safety uh, to, to going from two accesses off Yellowhead down to one, and that one being uh, primarily a, um, a truck traffic uh, access. Uh, and again, we, we had a very productive and positive meeting with the planning committee for the Yellowhead Trail uh, program, um, of which they, uh, they expressed their, their, um, their concerns as well with, with the public safety once, once we conveyed that to them and are, are actively working on a relocation plan for our review. So um, again, just in support of John and, and, uh, and thank you everyone for hearing us today. Thank you. Uh, questions for our presenters? I've got uh, Councillor Esslinger up first. Go ahead, Councillor Esslinger. Um, well, if there's committee members, I was happy to defer. Um, and I'll start with Mr. Thiessen. Um, I think we've been in correspondence, and my understanding as well is that in your meeting, you had agreed to do an alternate access for your staff to access your site. What hasn't been confirmed is the exact location yet. Is that right? Um, my understanding is that they're working on on an alternate access. I don't know that they've committed to that or not, but the, the, I understand they are definitely uh, working towards that end. Uh, I believe that that's what they're working on as well, and I'll ask administration that on your behalf. But I understand that they heard you loud and clear and agreed, and we're working on something. So. I will ask administration for you that question. Thank you. Uh, now, Mr. Samji, um, I understand that your concern isn't about the closure, but about uh, the timing and that you prefer to have all the agreements settled prior to any access closure. Is, is that the gist of it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and I will ask administration that question as well. Uh, I've heard that. Thank you very much. Uh, those are all my questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions for the speakers? Not seeing any, then uh, thank you all three of you for your comments. Uh, feel free to stay on the line here and observe as we uh, pivot to questions of city officials on what's before us and what's been raised. Um, <clears throat> Shall we defer to Councillor Essinger again? As most familiar with these, go ahead, Bev. Thank you very much. Um, this will start with uh, Mr. Thiessen's property downsons. Um, I believe that when you met with them last week, you had committed to working on an acceptable alternate access. Is, is that correct? That's correct, Councillor Essinger. Our team has met with, with him, and we feel reasonably confident that we'll have an alternative uh, access um, still yet to be confirmed and we have to meet and, and agree to what that looks like, but we feel reasonably comfortable that we should be able to provide some alternative to that access. So I, I think he'll be happy to know that's what we're saying. We're all in agreement that that's what'll happen. So thank you very much. Um, and then regarding uh, the property that Mr. Samji represents, the Ramada Yellowhead, could you speak to me about some of the actions you're taking on that? His request was, to delay access change until there's an agreement in place. And I don't know what our normal practices are and how that works. Well, I, I think one thing probably to confirm first and foremost, and that is by approving the bylaw, it's, it's, there is some time yet before we actually go through with the physical closure. So what's presented in front of you today is the, the legal closure of the access, but the physical closure isn't anticipated to happen for those sites until sometime this fall. We're at a point in the project where um, we've reached the design completion of the work and we're ready to tender the work for construction. But in order to uh, tender it, we need some assurances for the contractor that the legal processes have been concluded. So that's really the impetus as to why we're having to present this to you today is that we need uh, a decision around the access closures that will then allow us to tender the work and then proceed with construction 
but we don't anticipate physical closure to happen until um, sometime later this fall. So while that is also occurring, we also, um, in, in specifically um, referring to the, the Ramada site, we are in the process of uh, continuing to negotiate as to the acquisition separately from the access closure, but knowing that it is the same site, we are working with them on that as well. And there are members of legal services and our corporate services uh, folks on the call as well to answer any questions related to that. I guess I'm just trying to understand, we're not gonna close access till the fall. Is it reasonable to think that the uh, expropriation and all the details would be completed by that point? Maybe someone could tell me if that's a reasonable expectation because I think that's what they're asking. I'll maybe defer to uh, Mr. Buck or Mrs. Bowen to answer that question. Or, or uh, counselor, I'm sorry, it's uh, Gord Buck from Legal Services. Uh, so in answer to your to your question, um, what we're dealing with today is the access closure. Um, there is also a separate uh, expropriation proceeding which will deal with the um, partial expropriation of a small piece of land from the southern part of the property that, that needs to be expropriated. Um, the land that we're proposing to expropriate uh, is not the same land where the access closures are located. So um, there are two separate uh, issues in that sense. Uh, we are still negotiating with the property owners in relation to the um, expropriation proceedings, um, whether the expropriation uh, proceedings will be entirely resolved by the fall. Um, I can't say that for sure. Um, at the very least, we will, I expect that we will have completed the actual expropriation. Um, but whether we've come to a resolution on compensation at that point, um, we may or may not. Certainly, that's our goal. Um, but again, from a legal perspective, there are two separate issues that are proceeding on two separate tracks and and one frankly isn't really um, dependent on the other um, but again we're in discussions with uh, with mr. Sanji on the expropriation side as well and you know we would hope to have a resolution of all the issues by the fall but at the very least we will have completed the actual expropriation and acquisition of the land Okay, so although they're separate, you are working towards that goal and Mr. Samshi can work with you to expedite that as much as he can. Is that my understanding? Uh, yes, we're, we're in ongoing discussion with uh, Mr. Samji actually with his counsel, legal counsel on the expropriation side. So, um, you know, we will we will do our best to uh, resolve the expropriation issues and uh, any compensation to the extent that we're able to. And if we're not able to resolve compensation, then it would it would go to the Land Compensation Board. Okay. So thank you. I think that's what we can ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Essinger. Any other questions? Uh, motions arising. Councillor Carmel. I'm happy to move the recommendation in the report. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the recommendation uh, to send the bylaw to council for three readings is before us here. Um, any further debate? Councillor Essinger, did you wish to speak? Any further? Yes, if I may. Go ahead. Uh, I certainly support this going ahead. I, I think uh, in good faith, we are working with both of the groups that are speaking today, uh, Mr. Thiessen, and they've been working towards that. So I think it'll address his concerns. And I think as much as possible, what I heard today is that we are working with uh, Mr. Samji's group as well. So I feel confident 
because we need to get this done so we can move to tender. It's the right way to go with this today, but we've heard the concerns and are working on them. Thank you. Thank you. Any further thoughts? Not seeing any, please vote. Display the vote. And that's carried. So we've got, by my count, three items left. Um, the uh, GBA Plus um, update, the Digital Action Plan update, and the um, social procurement item, which has a number of speakers attached to it. So we do have uh, 80 minutes, which um, might be enough for for all of it, uh, but we might be able to roll over um, one of these items so that staff are not on standby if we if we uh, know which one we aren't going to get to. Um, uh, the suggestion here is the digital action plan we roll off to February 1st. Yeah. Uh, or there may be some other options too, though. So uh, just if we take no other action, we'd be at a GBA plus update first, which I uh, I think um, is a very good report, um, uh, and and we'll have a bit of discussion, but not uh, extensive. I don't think. I might be wrong, but um, the other one might be more substantive. Anyway, Councillor Walters, what's your suggestion? Well, just on that, I'd selected it because I thought the presentation and an update on the work, and I know. Um, Folks from Edmonton Global are on standby as well um, uh, to talk about some of the work they're doing related to the 5G piece of it, particularly. So I wouldn't want to hold them up all day if we're not going to get to it anyways. And but we can we can see they've been on standby all day, <laughs> so we can. I'm I just raised it because I wasn't sure what you were thinking, Mr. Mayor, in terms of timing. Yeah. Well, we've got five speakers on social procurement. So that's probably an hour with Q&A and other things. That gets us to after 5 o'clock, and then um, 20 minutes left maybe, give or take, um, and I'm notoriously bad at estimating these things, to deal with the other two items. So, um, But we've come this far is the other, is the other uh, thought, so we could see how far we get on these. Well, maybe let's just leave it and see how it goes. Okay. Um, the other thing we could do is I understand there may be motions arising on social procurement, but that those would end up coming at council because Councillor Paquette's not on the committee. So we might be able to hear from the speakers and then um, go further on it uh, at, at, uh, at another time. So what we might be able to do is um, another option is we could quickly deal with 6-6 uh, six, six and 6-7, six, get them out of the way, and then um, and then finish with procurement as well, and um, get as far as we can get before 5:30, and then and then uh, ship it to council for uh, further action. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the other two will be fairly quick, so bear with us, and then we'll finish uh, strong uh, with. Uh, we'll make sure to leave time to hear from speakers. If we're running short, we'll we'll. Uh, will juggle. So uh, to the speakers who've been with us all day, thank you. Stick with us. We'll come to you soon. We've just tried to clear a couple of other items uh, here um, that deserve a bit of uh, a conversation, but but don't have speakers. They won't take as long. So it, let's can proceed in order then, which is 6-6, um, six, six, the uh, GBA Plus update. Uh, this one's here as an information report. Um, excellent report. Are there any introductory comments to it? Uh, good afternoon, uh, committee and your worship. I do have a uh, brief, uh, less than two minutes, I hope, of uh, introductory remarks, if I may. And I'm joined by Lee, our equity specialist, who is our, our GBA plus um, resident genius. So, uh, and, and the person who's been um, behind uh, much of this work. May I just jump into my speaking notes, your worship? Go ahead. Thank you. So we appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. At the June 24, 2019 Executive Committee meeting, a motion was passed 
that administration provide an update to this committee on the implementation and impacts of GBA plus analysis within the city, including examples. And I'm here today to share with you some of the progress that we have made toward implementing GBA plus throughout our organization. We'd like to come back on an annual basis to provide you with updates on our progress as it unfolds. At its core, GBA Plus is an inclusion lens that fits underneath the larger diversity and inclusion umbrella and is a key component in the art of inclusion, our framework launched in December of 2019. Our framework outlines that pathways for inclusion require building the necessary mindset, heart set, and skill set. In order to move GBA Plus forward, we have created structures of support for employees via consultation, learning, and tools, and work directly with teams across the corporation to understand their specific needs and create successes for others to learn from. And finally, as we've discussed previously, integrated GBA Plus as an important part of our response to COVID-19. We've made great progress in building tools, training, and resources necessary to support this work. And so far, we believe it's having a deep impact on the way we work at the city, on our employees, and importantly, on our services to citizens. We've had great insight, which has allowed us to make changes across the corporation, from adjustments to things like car seats in vans for the bus network plan redeployment, to understanding the needs of vulnerable populations on the streets so they can be safer, to changing building plans to include Indigenous smudging opportunities. These are only a few of many examples of the GBA plus work completed across the city. And as you've referenced, there are more examples in the report. I'm proud of the significant progress we've made and our recognition that the implementation of GBA plus is even more important during these turbulent and difficult times. This past year, we heard from the public and our employees about systemic racism and systems of discrimination and oppression, and our ELT continues to be committed to addressing these issues. In fact, this year, we're embarking in a year-long training program on anti-racism that includes readings, podcasts, formal training, and deep discussion on how systems create inequality and what we can do to address it. Our commitment has increased only, sorry, has only increased over the past year as we continue to grow our GBA plus maturity, continue to focus on the hearts, minds, and skills of our employees to make Edmonton a place where all people feel considered, included, and welcome. And we're pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much uh, for those comments and all of the, the rich work behind them. Um, questions? Uh, Councillor Esslinger? Thank you, and I really appreciate the update. And, you know, you had a couple of minutes to talk about a lot of work that's happened even during a pandemic. So thank you very much for all the work and for everyone's contribution to that. Uh, I have some specific questions. I was curious... And I really love the what we heard document and the examples that you provided. I thought they were really rich. In particular, I wanted to ask about the fire rescue example, because it was really talking about how to uh, improve underrepresentation of women. Um, and it, it talked about the work, but when will we see that action or how does that roll out? I'm going to quickly start with uh, one part of the response, and then I'm going to turn it over to Lee as they uh, they will be able to supplement. I'm absolutely delighted to advise that Chief Zatilny uh, recently uh, requested and um, and funded a new FTE position in fire rescue services, which will be attached to um, our diversity and inclusion team working full time with fire rescue as an equity specialist to support the diversity and inclusion agenda that he is undertaking uh, in his service. So we just extended an offer and it was accepted by a fantastic candidate who will be coming on board uh, and devoting uh, their time exclusively 
to supporting DNI work in fire rescue. But I will turn it over to Lee for any uh, additional comments or insights that they um, might be able to offer. Uh, thanks, Kim. I don't have a ton to offer, but I would just say that we do have, um, uh, uh, we're creating a really robust plan to not only address um, recruitment, but also culture within uh, FIRE. So it's just really important that we know that it's not just about increasing diversity, that it also means an inclusive culture. So that's an important part of our process. I appreciate that and appreciate the depth of the work, the research that was done in the committee to get to that point because it wasn't just trying to make it happen, it was trying to understand the barriers and that was key to making a successful uh, change, I think. Uh, my other question is, and I was really thrilled to read many of the employee comments that it was easier to make some decisions when considering who might be excluded, asking the question who we are missing, that they felt they were better able to meet the needs of the public or the colleagues I guess I was wondering, um, because we're training, um, I guess, top down, um, if anyone's interested, can they access GBA plus training or do we do it continually based on position? Lee, why don't you take this one? Um, just before the pause for COVID, we did launch GBA plus uh, training specific to the city tool that we've created that would be open to anyone that would want to take it. Um, within departments, there are some folks that we're targeting for training a little bit more, and we are creating a uh, virtual training to sort of replace that in-person training. As you read in the report, uh, employees have said really clearly that it's really important to do that sort of face-to-face -face training with a subject matter expert because they can ask really specific questions. So we're changing that into a virtual environment. And then the goal is to have that open to all employees. And I guess my, my final question is, um, as we're going through that, have you met with uh, resistance from employees? And has that changed once they understand better that it's really about building a city for everyone? Go ahead, Lee. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. I have to admit, we have had very little resistance from employees. Most resistance is about understanding more so than not wanting to do it. Um, employees are pretty dedicated to this work on the whole. Um, what little resistance we have faced actually at the end of the training and after doing some of the work, folks um, have said, I was surprised now, I didn't know what this actually was. And now that I understand the resistance is very minimal. Thank you. Well, I just have a few seconds left, but I wanted to say thank you for this work. And I look forward to the annual updates because I know more is going to happen. Um, but for everyone that it's changing their actions, I thought that was a phenomenal statement in the document. Um, really, we're learning how to be a city for everyone. It links into the work you're doing with anti-racism as well. So thank you all. And please express our gratitude to everyone that's undertaken this work and is changing our city. And uh, we're an example to many and appreciate your hard work to get us there. Thank you so much. Much appreciated, Councillor. Um, well said, Councillor. I couldn't agree more. Um, I have had, I'm trying to click in, and I understand Councillor Knack is trying to click in as well and is not able to. So, uh, uh, Councillor Walters. Uh, okay, I'll go to Councillor Walters uh, on committee and we'll make a note. Uh, and uh, let us know if you're trying to get on. So, Councillor Walters, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, firstly, just a word of appreciation to all of you for this report. Um, grateful to to see this this progress. Uh, I, I did have a question about evaluation. So, just just to use uh, the transit security example that's uh, in the uh, what we heard report. Uh, you know, I know we've talked about that extensively. It came, you know, Councillor Esslinger has brought it forward and it's come out a wave and, you know, we've talked about that uh, quite a bit. I wonder about how how we're evaluating uh, whether or not transit, you know, once we put that lens on, you know, our application of transit safety strategies, how we're evaluating whether they're working and, and, and how we know that, you know, people, all people are feeling safe on transit. So I just, I just want you to sort of follow that through for me a little bit. Thanks, Councillor. Um, just, I want to start with a general comment and then I'll let Lee um, um, come in with some more specifics. 
evaluation is a critical component of the program because it helps us learn and it allows for that continuous growth and development cycle to proceed. So um, we're very um, committed not only to evaluation, but also to data collection, because if we don't have accurate data at the start, then we are um, hindered in the uh, proper implementation of GBA+. Plus. But, but I will um, invite Lee to provide more, uh, more background. Thanks, Kim. So we know that uh, evaluating the effectiveness of GBA plus is complicated because we can't really tell the mistakes we don't make because we've heard from more people. And we can't always know what the um, far reaching impacts are because we don't have a baseline to start with. And so some of the um, evaluation we do is through logic modeling. And so we know that the theory says if we do A, then B will happen. And so just ensuring that that logic modeling is, is true as we work through the process. Um, and then another thing uh, that is really important is qualitative data. So this is the storytelling. And this is one of the reasons we created the What We Heard report in the way that we created it, because we wanted those stories to be shared. And I think that working through those. And, and like I always say to folks, we're not going to change a whole project on one anecdotal story, but that one anecdotal story can give us an indication of areas we might want to do more research on. And a key part of the tool that we've created at the city is measuring and evaluating the equity measures we put in place as a response to our GBA plus process. Okay, thank you for that. And then I guess thinking, you know, you know, across the whole city in terms of people's use of our recreation services and programming. I wonder about uh, this lens on programming design. One thing we heard in some of our live active uh, discussions was the, uh, you know, it's a higher likelihood of, of, you know, younger males from immigrant communities, you know, using our, our rec services, you know, and, and programs across the city more frequently because, um, you know, young women in immig immigrant communities, for example, are often left with childcare responsibilities because their parents are working multiple jobs. And I just, I just, any comments or thinking around, um, around that as well. Uh, go ahead, Lee. I think that um, we can't get into the specific, specific specifics of every program, but I think that as we continue to do more research and understanding the needs of the communities that we serve, we will be able to make adjustments. And so, you know, I know we offer child minding um, sometimes for those folks that do have childcare responsibilities. And those are things that we want to continue to explore with the GBA plus process. We want to make sure that we understand what's happening first, and then we can come up with solutions that work best for those communities. Good. Okay. Thanks for this work. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I think my questions have been um, asked around the fire program. Uh, I guess, what's the next touch point on, on that for us? Uh, this is a great window into some of the kind of work that was happening there. Um, but, uh, uh, and I know that um, this came up somewhere else. I can't remember. It was discussed at committee not that long ago. Um, and I think we asked for more information on that then. So, uh, so this is a good window into that. But that question of uh, diversity and recruitment and the point about culture is very, very well taken to that. It's, when is that going to come back to, to council for further discussion or is it planned to? So, Your Worship, you're correct. It was a separate report, um, and I believe it was in September, uh, and the report was more about diversity within the city and its various occupational categories, one of which was fire. Um, I don't know the date, but it is um, on a different track than the GBA Plus um, report that we're bringing here today. So we would be able to circle back with clerk's office and find out when the update on, um, on the diversification of our workforce is, is coming back to council or to exec committee. Well, and, and, and that's good. I'll look forward to that. I think the point is I'm really reassured at this account of, uh, how the, the, the research and evaluation going into that is benefiting from this tool. So it's less a question and more just um, gratitude that, um, and, and we don't always get a look into these things until they're well underway, but this gives me real confidence that that's gonna come back. I've spoken a bit to, uh, 
Chief Zatilny about about this question as he's come on board and knowing that he'll have the benefit of this is really really helpful. Um, the other question I have about this is uh, this is very focused on administration but um, we have also uh, determined that members of council uh, should receive this training uh, as part of um, uh, our orientation and so we are uh, less than a year now away from at least some new orientations and perhaps refreshers as the materials have have developed for existing members of council and so it's not mentioned in here and it's more a matter of transition but for consistency's sake um, do you need further direction or does the previous direction um, is it self-evident <laughs> I guess that we should be doing this on an ongoing basis with new members of council and and continuing members of council um, Your Worship, I will happily bring um, bring that um, potential training opportunity forward to uh, the new city manager and for discussion with the clerk, and we would be more than pleased to provide um, materials and or in person and or virtual uh, training for uh, for the new council. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I would just add, and thanks, Kim. Um, I, I would just add, this never ends. Uh, GBA plus is something that you have to continually train on and you have to do refresher training on GBA plus in, in particular so I think the answer uh, your worship is we'd be delighted to help out with training of, of existing councillors and new councillors uh, I think it's an absolutely essential um, aspect of GBA plus you have to continue the the refresher training and if you don't you lose that skill set like any skill set and so I think we just have to keep going on this from a training perspective well and I think that that just uh, reinforces Lee's earlier point that uh, there there's the mechanics but then there's also the culture and making sure that that culture is um, embodied by elected leadership as well and that we're uh, able to speak within that culture um, from from some common knowledge and conceptual frameworks and experiences both on the technical side but also uh, in the the heart space as it's described in the report I think I think does require um, that continuous engagement and so uh, so I'm glad to hear that that's on the on the radar for transition that's good um, and uh, this was great to read just to just to uh, echo previous comments that uh, particularly the comments from employees who sort of had their aha moments and were prepared to share those in the um, qualitative feedback on this um, and and I thought the thoughts about a return on investment in terms of um, it's still hard to quantify that in hard dollar terms, although we'll continue to try to work towards that, but that uh, the reputational benefits to the city, um, which is an intangible, but is incredibly important with the amount of damage public institutions are going under these days and the uh, level to expect we're, we're being expected to rise to on these questions, I think it's only, uh, only appropriate for us to be as upfront but not complacent as possible on this. So this gives me some confidence in that regard. So um, I'll leave it there and go next to Councillor Knack. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And actually, I was going to ask a little bit about the that notion of refresher training too, and not just at the beginning of the term for maybe returning members of council. I was going to ask about opportunities that might exist throughout council's term to to have other either a refresher of that specific training or enhancements of other training. And, and I'll give a very specific example. When I got onto the library board, we just um, did training from the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion, which included an unconscious bias training. Uh, and that was uh, continued to be enlightening about the things that I realize I don't know, uh, even after trying to do all these other things. So uh, can, can we think about not just the the, you know, the first week or the first month of, of that, of what the next council experience, but have some opportunities and some check-ins throughout the, the term so we can keep learning. Cause I found that to be really valuable for me. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Councillor, we have the implicit bias training um, in the respect in the workplace area, uh, which is adjacent to the work Lee is doing. And um, same thing, our folks who have gone through the training have, uh, had many aha moments, uh, all of us. We have all learned something through the experience of that training. So we are here to support council however uh, however they wish in that regard. 
great. Yeah, I think I think that'd be great just to have multiple check-ins on that. Uh, the only other question I have, uh, and just something that I know that's come up in some other conversations I've had in the last few months, is when we talk about the GBA Plus, obviously, and you even talk about it in the background of the report, the how the plus is meant to then consider a variety of other factors, and how how do we make sure that we're not forgetting all of those other pieces that make up plus. And I don't know if that makes sense. I saw one nodding head and maybe one confused look. So I, I don't know if it's perfectly clear, but I, I, I have heard feedback that sometimes it's, we, you know, we're quick to make sure we've, we're addressing gender, but then there's a lot of other factors in the plus that, that's, I mean, we just may forget because it's even a long list on the report. So how do you keep the rest of those aspects sort of top of mind in what we do and in, in what we do as a city? And, uh, and I think uh, the, the short answer is the tool itself, counselor, requires you to, to turn your mind to factors other than gender. But I, but I will let Lee elaborate uh, because they are very, uh, very familiar with the tool. Thanks, Kim. One of the things that we're doing um, that's maybe a little bit different than other people that are other uh, orders of government that are doing GBA Plus is we really, really highlight that gender is not the thing we're always focusing on. So it's important to still focus on gender and, and that's really critical, but GBA plus and the way that we're approaching it is really an anti-oppression lens. And so when anti-racism really blew up, for example, last spring, we were already positioned to talk about that because we've already been talking about that in our GBA plus work. And so while we might start with gender on one project, another project might need to start in, in a racialized area. And another project might need to look at disability first. And so what we're trying to get folks to wrap their minds around is anti-oppression and not just one single uh, issue. And so when we do our training, it really does focus on how do we think through our unconscious biases around all of these areas. And so we're really, we're really highlighting that in the work that we're doing in the city. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate the, that answer and all the work you're doing. And, and also my thanks to Councillor Essinger for continuing to make sure this is top of mind for us on council. Thank you, uh, Councillor Paquette. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for this report. Um, it's amazing, actually. I, uh, I had a couple questions. The first is, um, you know, one thing that, uh, that was surprising to me that I learned in the past couple weeks are that uh, certain words are ableist. And um, I'm just wondering uh, if... I mean, it seems a little prescriptive, but are, are we going to be providing that sort of uh, training to folks? Um, so, Councillor, when, when you uh, say that sort of training, can I just ask a question? Do you mean just in general how we can use more inclusive language? Like, because. Yeah, how we can use more inclusive language and uh, describe, yeah, even when we have the best of intentions trying to describe dilemmas might, people might have navigating the city. Uh, uh, just through decades of not even thinking about it, we use terms that uh, are ableist and maybe f make others feel less than or excluded. Yes, absolutely. I'll let Lee talk specifically, but uh, the point's an excellent one. And also to uh, when we are having conversations about this, to do it with compassion and not shame. So to, um, you know, to, to talk to someone, maybe they're using the term blind spot as an example, uh, or tone deaf as an example. Um, and just to, to talk to them about what that might feel like for someone who hears that, who comes from a different lived experience, and just to get that kind of reflection going, um, because we have really a strong belief in the work that we do at the city, that if people feel shamed, they shut down, and uh, they're not open to um, having, you know, real dialogue and meaningful conversation. So I really like your question, and um, and each one of us every day has the opportunity to learn and grow around the use of language. But I'm going to also have Lee weigh in um, as, as the expert on this. Thanks, Kim. I really appreciate that. And, and I, I just want to reiterate what Kim said. You know, when we talk about creating a heart set mindset and skill set, you know, most employees already kind of have the heart set. Um, uh, and so some of it is that mindset. So if people know better, they'll do better. Um, and so we, you know, we've created an inclusive language guide. We've uh, worked with 
communications and engagement to make sure that all comms plans have a GBA plus lens. And that includes inclusive language. And so that's really critical to um, starting the dialogue in a space where we're all having a common language around it. And the non-shame part is really, really important because we have to know not only how to correct our own behavior, but how to correct others who may not know better and that want to do better. Um, nobody wants to sort of uh, make people uncomfortable, I think, for the most part. So we just want to build that mindset more. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. And, and culturally as well, because I think, uh, you know, there's certain phrases that maybe people are unaware might not be great, like, uh, um, let's have a powwow about that, or, uh, um, you know, sacred cow. And, you know, these are these are words that maybe... <laughs> Uh, to the dominant culture seem fine, but uh, to other cultures maybe are not really appropriate usage of those phrases. Um, okay, so my other question is, uh, during the uh, during our hearings in the summer, I was really struck by how many young people came on and immediately introduced themselves or even had in their uh, description uh, on Google Meet their, their pronouns. And it's not something, to be perfectly honest, I... I that really factored into my thinking before. But since then, I've noticed that I am really, really hyper aware of that. And, uh, in a, and I certainly don't want to give offense to people, but more so I want to honor people and uh, their identity and their experience in the world. And one of the good things that we have in our email now is that ability to add that. But most of us, when, they, when we come on board, and most employees, I think, you know, you set up your email, you never look at it again for years. So is there going to be sort of a proactive uh, effort to, to sort of uh, let people know that this is a possibility that they can, they can make this change uh, if they haven't? Um, very timely question. ELT was just talking about the use of pronouns like within the last week and, um, and the need for us to be um, extending an invitation to folks to consider the use of pronouns and explaining um, why that's something we'd like them to think about. And at the same time, um, not trying to prompt people or make people feel like they need to disclose um, if they're not at the point in their journey where they want to identify with pronouns. So finding that balance between inviting folks to consider using uh, using their pronouns and, um, and not making them feel like they have some kind of an obligation to do so. Lee and I were just, um, just uh, dialoguing about this uh, literally the other day, but Lee, I'll, I'll have you um, add anything to that. Yeah, we want to make sure, like, using pronouns is a signal to a lot more than just letting people know what your pronouns are. It's a signal that you understand that there are more than two genders and that that you support folks that might um, identify somewhere else other than the, at the binary. And so, but at the same time, like Kim said, it's really important that it's not mandatory. So for people that, you know, do struggle to participate in understanding gender in that way. We don't want to force them to participate in something they don't understand yet. Um, and then also for folks who might be grappling with their own gender identity, we don't want to make them have to out themselves or lie. So it can't be mandatory, but we have done um, just recently in the employee services town hall, there was a presentation on pronoun use and what it can mean. And for me, I use they, them pronouns. And when I see that on somebody's signature, it tells me that that's somebody who's friendly and who I could talk to or who I could be safe with. And so it is really important and, and we just have to be careful how we do it. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And really the effort is just to be able to give people um, the proper respect rather than trying to put people on the spot. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Not seeing any. This one's a move uh, for uh, receipt of information. I will move that, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Walters. Um, please, uh, is there anyone wishing to speak to that? We've had good discussion so far. So not seeing any, please vote. We have five votes. Display the vote. Carried. Okay. Um, so we are down to 50 minutes. Um, and next up 
is um, the digital action plan implementation and partner programs and let's try to leave at least half an hour to hear from speakers on the other items so if we start to run out of time on this one we'll, uh, uh, we'll adjust accordingly so um, but let's get started on this one there's a presentation, Ms. Pearson. Go ahead. Here's a presentation. So good morning, members of Executive Committee. Um, I'm presenting today with the support of the Branch Manager of Open City and Technologies, Daryl Croft, as well Malcolm Bruce and Lynette Tremblay of Edmonton Global are available to answer questions about the overall efforts to position Edmonton's readiness for new technologies. The report before you was written internally by the city. However, Edmonton Global plays a big role in making industry connections and applications for the Digital Action Plan. So in response to the October 28th, 2019 Executive Committee motion about the implementation of the Digital Action Plan, as well as any associated partner programs, the report covers a number of things. Administrations work towards the objectives of the Digital Action Plan. This includes over two dozen actions listed in the attachment to the report. It also includes the current state of 5G, 5G rollout and technology, as well as the city's role in 5G implementation. It contains an overview of partner programs, including the Living Lab concept that TELUS presented to this committee. is a bit delayed because of uh, COVID. And it also has next steps to align, integrate, and advance the digital action plan moving forward. Attachment 2 of the report is a summary of the city's actions to achieve the two goals and six objectives of the plan. With the goal of creating a connected community and bridging the digital divide, there are three objectives listed. I'll provide some examples of the work undertaken. So to, enhan to enhance resident experience, we've been working with our provincial partners to implement a consistent framework for a citizen digital ID. This could be a building block serving citizens across all levels of government. The Alberta ID is a pilot that is working to integrate with the federal My Service Canada account. To increase access to broadband services, administration is working with partners like the Edmonton Public Library to ensure people who are underserved and at risk gain the secure and cost-effective connectivity to digital economy, social services, and civic administration activities. We're also working to allow the ETS customers access to cellular service well underground uh, with the underground portions of the LRT. The City of Edmonton is also establishing and advancing digital literacy and securing digital rights for current and future generations. This is through the work of our data governance office, our data ethics officer, is doing uh, some work with the City Coalition for Digital Rights, and we have also partnered with the other five large municipalities across Canada to support work in this space. Moving to goal two, we have and, con and continue to work on providing thought leadership. For the next generation deployments, we are moving forward with purpose. It is going to take many years to fully roll out 5G in Canadian cities. The reasons for this are explored briefly in the Council report. In the interim, Edmonton has adopted technology that permits our city to move into the, area, uh, the era of the Internet of Things. The City of Edmonton's LoRaWAN network is a long-range, wide-area network covering much of the city to power Internet of Things, specifically a low-cost network with thousands of sensors. A LoRaWAN network is by no measure a replacement for 5G, but it is a good interim step. One of the main areas of the action plan focus was to create a competitive advantage over other jurisdictions by reviewing and removing regulatory barriers to 5G deployment. We have updated the cellular vendor application process to improve the process to expand or modify service coverage. We have also mapped our current processes with different stakeholders and steps for each as the foundation to work with the telecommunications companies to remove municipal regulatory barriers to wireless network deployments. An administration is committed to ensuring cellular carriers do not see the right-of-way agreements or permit permitting processes as significant impediments to the continued rollout of 5G or as a barrier to entry. And finally, I want to discuss how economic de development objectives have taken on a new dynamic since last year. Um, thanks to our partners at Edmonton Global, who have been very active in this space, the city has used their work and our administrative voice to advocate for what is needed from other orders of government to success successfully achieve this objective. 
In the past 10 months, several formal mechanisms have been put in place to collaborate at a national and subnational level to explore an urban-based, technology-driven economic recovery from COVID-19 pandemic in Canada. The city man manager managers from Edmonton, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, Ottawa, and Montreal have met several times to discuss uh, the digital transformation. And feeding into these discussions are three new technology-focused tables that include membership from those cities as well as Winnipeg and Halifax. These tables have been building consensus to lead natural discu national discussions on digital initiatives focused on digital infrastructure, data, and service delivery. Edmonton chairs the data table and a strong representation on the other two tables. In addition to those meetings, we've met with the province and federal counterparts to discuss the competitive advantage of Edmonton due to our advanced digital infrastructure and how Edmonton can lead in a post-pandemic economic recovery. All of these discussions are ongoing. With respect to advocacy work, I'd like to discuss the role of the 5G. This is where the tele telecommunications companies play a larger role and municipalities have some agencies, albeit limited, on fostering quicker deployment. As I've mentioned for 5G, we're likely a number of years away from spectrum deployment and full implementation. Given current information, the Canadian government is expected to set service deadlines for the spectrum being auctioned this summer. That will give us a better idea of timing after that. For tier four services across, for tour, tier four service areas containing a majority population center like Edmonton, Telcos are required to deliver service to 30% of the population within five years and 70% in 20 years. So as you can see, the responsibility of regulating both the rollout and the health and environment concerns of 5G fall within the federal jurisdiction. That said, municipalities are working together to try and determine mutual priorities to align our efforts with other orders of government to leverage the strength of one another and influence the 5G rollout. So that covers the spectrum rollout and on the hardware side, the sensors currently on the marketplace and under development do not necessarily require 5G. Much of what you read about, about the Internet of Things can be done with 4G or LoRaWAN. So I want to be clear, I'm not downplaying the 5G element. It's just to unlock the next industrial revolution. It's going to be a seismic shift, but we can do some things in the interim. Which is why I would like to spend a bit of time on our, our LoRaWAN network. So beginning in 2018... Edmonton start smarted, started a small LoRaWAN pilot to test our capacity to pilot Internet of Things deployment. An example of early use of this technology is the installation of soil moisture sensors in downtown, uh, the downtown hanging baskets, the flower hanging baskets. Using this data from these sensors, administration was able to optimize maintenance plans and create efficiencies. Since then, we have built the network out, out to cover much of the city. So this is a digital infrastructure foundation that gives Edmonton a competitive advantage. Our LoRaWAN network is ready and has the potential to be a testing ground for smart city deployment. We also look forward to working with academic and industry partners which can develop the technologies that will drive the economic activity and determine future demand, such as for 5G. So to summarize, I have two points to highlight of what we've been doing over the past uh, 14 months since we last talked about the Digital Action Plan with Council. First, we have mobilized internally and with stakeholders to achieve some of, the, some of the big objectives of the plan. And second, we have built the digital infrastructure to make Edmonton an attractive destination to prototype, pilot, and scale up the next generation of technology that will drive the economy and shape the city of our future. Admittedly, there is more work to do. COVID did slow us down a bit, but we look forward to working with our partners on um, adjusting the plan going forward. Uh, we'd like to build on the original plan and focus on further on digitization of services, streamlining of telecommunication-related regulations and leveraging the next generation connectivity, bridging the digital divide, and leading and partnering with others for local, provincial, and national discussions and initiatives to recover from and prepare for future, and recover from the pandemic and prepare for the future. And with that, um, I, I apologize, I cut a whole bunch of my speaking notes out, but I hope we got the flavor that we are moving forward with focus.
That's great. Thank you. Um, questions on this? Uh, Councillor Walters had selected it, so I'll start with you. Thank you. Yeah, so just a couple. So thanks for the report and all the work on it. I know that it's been, uh, you guys have been juggling a lot of stuff. So, uh, But certainly the, the emphasis on the uh, post-pandemic uh, world uh, and the value that this uh, offers to that I think is important and, and why this is, uh, I'm grateful for this to be here. So just maybe give me a little bit more of the streamlining of the the infrastructure investments uh, and making sure that the telcos have access to those. Maybe just say a little bit, like what what can be streamlined? I'm going to uh, get Mr. Croft to talk mm -hmm. to that. Absolutely. Um, Councilor, in terms of streamlining investments and included in the attachment here is the city's overall governance process, but will be a focus on the um, permitting processes that are typically undertaken by the telecommunications carriers. So they would indicate historically it had been a fairly significant burden for them to just administratively get through these types of requests for the permit and then the subsequent request to gain access to city infrastructure, then the subsequent request for access to some of the underpinning utilities. Okay. So it is, in fact, you know, in terms of that, I appreciate the chart about the roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, in fact, the least we can do and the most important thing that a municipality and our sort of core function can provide in terms of sort of setting the table for all this to, to happen. That's correct. Good. We do so, need partners. And, and because it's, you know, we have sort of a nice runway here waiting for the federal government to, uh, you know, release um, capacity through these auctions, we, like, we can get, a, like, I, I suppose... This is a real head start. Is that fair to say? That's our intent. Yes, Councilor. Okay. That's great. Uh, and so just, I wanted to give opportunity as well to, to either, I don't know if Malcolm or Lynette uh, are on the line, uh, just to talk a little bit about uh, what Edmonton Global sees as the primary opportunities in the short and medium term uh, in this area and, and talk a little bit about what you're doing <clears throat> to take advantage of those opportunities. I believe Malcolm is uh, called in over the phone. So Malcolm, are you there? He was struggling with some connectivity earlier today. Uh, so perhaps in his absence, I could uh, speak a little bit to um, some of the short and uh, longer term opportunities that we see um, in the, uh, the work that um, uh, our colleagues at the City of Edmonton kindly referenced. Uh, we partnered with post-secondary institutions, um, private uh, industry, and also economic development and innovation entities to look at what was possible from an economic impact, uh, workforce development, and innovation perspective uh, in the entire region. And we looked at the development of 5G through uh, a node-based approach. So looking at publicly accessible or public infrastructure and leveraging that as a 5G node uh, to be used by the largest number of businesses and innovators and students possible. So for things like immersive learning uh, and uh, autonomous systems, smart cities, technology, that kind of thing. And so we came up with um, 22, at least, potential nodes across the region and six use cases, one of which is smart cities and smart government, uh, but six use cases based on what our strengths are in the region. So that's a little bit of the work that we've been doing. And we see um, the ability to immediately implement certain initiatives. For example, Nate is looking at creating a, a 5G node of, out of their productivity and innovation center. And then also longer term possibilities as well. Um, ultimately, we see the Edmonton region as potentially becoming a global test bed for uh, the development and commercialization of new technologies, especially across those traditional sectors where we have strengths. Sorry. I guess in the 22 nodes, uh, maybe just uh, talk about one or, or two of the opportunities that you see for specific uh, new technology, commercialization of, of, new, of, of new research and technology and how that would grow and can grow uh, our economy here locally. So maybe just Absolutely. sort of play it out a little bit. Uh, certainly in healthcare, uh, if I were to look at the city of Edmonton itself, that's a really growing space. Uh, so health AI is expected to grow um, at a compound annual interest rate of uh, growth rate of, of 40%. Uh, 
so health AI, and um, even uh, in the augmented and virtual reality space. So if we were to equip uh, the University of Alberta, and even um, NorQuest has pointed out, and uh, McEwen, uh, their uh, capacity for immersive health technology, uh, those would be opportunities in 5G across the region, there's also an ability to uh, to be able to commercialize. Health City is is uh, create is partnering with a lot of private companies and piloting projects across Alberta in terms of sensors and in all forms of other virtual care. Uh, so we can certainly uh, be able to pilot those in the city here. So I think health technology for sure. Uh, interactive digital media is another space uh, where if we were to create uh, nodes and um, innovation collision opportunities, uh, there are basically any number of uh, locations across the city that could could speak to that. Right. And then Thank broad in the broader region, certainly. Thanks, Ms. Tromley. I've gone over my allotted time. So I'll thank you all for the, the presentation and the, and the input today. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Henderson. Or sorry, Councillor McKean is on the committee. Councillor McKean. Thank you. And I'm going to try to be really quick. I know we're under the gun. First of all, I'm going to offer a solid B for the report in, in a plain language sense. Uh, I think I mostly understood it, but I think it's really important. I think that's really important because this is exciting and I want to understand it fully and some of the answers uh, Daryl and Lynette just gave helped a bit more with that. So, but a solid B is a good, uh, is, it's a good grade. So please accept that as a uh, commendation. The other one I, I, I wanted to ask about the community safety deployment model, which I know was there was, I saw a brief presentation at reach and it's using data, uh, in sort of predictive policing. I don't know if you'd have anybody on the call today to talk more about that? Do you? I don't know if Mr. Cross can do it or we, we might have to get something later. The only, the only other thing I was gonna say is, you know, one of those uh, lunch and learn sessions, I just think it's a really exciting, interesting collaborative project uh, involving multiple partners, uh, bylaw, peace officers, police uh, and others and, and predicting who, who needs to be on call when. Um, Daryl, you're nodding your head. Do you, do you want to jump in? Um, just briefly, Councilor McKean, and, and related to the model, you've summarized it quite nicely. So a collaborative effort between ourselves and external agencies, using the data that we've garnered from multiple systems, and then applying um, advanced analytics for exactly what you described, sort of predictive models, as well as better social outreach. So the analogy that was used as this was formed was not everything maybe takes a peace officer or a police officer or a bylaw officer. Sometimes it may be a social agency that is better equipped to deal with it. So some of these models are starting to predict the type of resource that would be most suitable to be dispatched to a situation. That's oh, you just, you just muted yourself. Sorry, I, I said that's very high level, but we are quite comfortable to come back in a lunch and learn and, and go through the model in more detail. I think it's really fascinating and it goes way beyond uh, there's a full moon coming up. We need to have everybody on duty, right? It's It really does look at patterns. Um, and then and as you evaluate that, you sort of could predict who and where to have in place. Yes. Um, I, again, the, the model and the patterns get better with more data and more use cases into it. So it's been a model that goes through continuous refinement, but that is ultimately what we've achieved and, and we'll continue to refine that. Yeah, I, it's really cool. And I, I would love to hear more about it at some point in the future. Mr. Mayor, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question about something that I hope um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's another th uh, uh, app that we've been running, and it just got flagged for me the other day, so I thought I'd grab the question now while I could. Um, it's the YEG Open Tree Map, which I gather, and if you don't have the answer now, that's fine. I can get it offline, but I just wanted to grab this chance to ask it. 
that I gather the third party provider that we've been working with isn't going to support it anymore. So we can't continue to go on it. But the real question is what happens to the data and whether that whether we can make sure we hold on to that and it can still be uh, publicly available. Because I think there are some other groups that are using it for uh, uh, carbon sequestration numbering and GHG uh, uh, quantification and things like that. So I, it just got flagged for me and I thought I'd ask the question right now to make sure we don't lose that understanding. We can't have the map anymore, but make sure we don't lose the, the data and it'll still be available. Councillor Henderson, um, I will take it away to validate, but I do believe that the data will remain with us and, and resident in that open data catalog that we do maintain. Great, good. I just thought I'd ask the question why you guys were here. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions? Not seeing any. Um, uh, lots going on here, which is exciting, um, but I th in the interest of time, we'll We'll move along here. So, Councillor Walters, do you want to move receipt of information? I will move receipt of information, 6.7. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, glad to hear about the collaboration with Global on this, as well as the uh, collaboration with, with uh, other cities looking at the opportunities here, uh, just parenthetically. Um, anything further before we vote? Please vote on receipt of information. We have five votes, Mr. Mayor. Display the vote, please. And that's carried. And then last but not least on our agenda, and thank you to the speakers who've been patient uh, as we get to you here today. Um, we should have time to hear from everybody before we run out of time in this meeting. So um, I've, I think you've heard me run through the procedures a few times. I won't waste any time with that. Uh, but if you do have any questions, let us know. Um, we'll now hear uh, on... A I don't think that are there any introductory comments or straight to straight to speakers. Okay, so um, Councillor Briquette's inquiry on social procurement is before us uh, with a comprehensive report. Uh, so now we will hear uh, first from Scott Crichton from IBE Local 424, uh, then Rob Calver from Building Trades of Alberta, then Eric Ampen from M Poverty Edmonton, then Susanna Cameron from M Poverty Edmonton, and David LePage from Buy Social Canada. So. Uh, Mr. Creighton, you're up first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, members of the Executive Committee, for hearing my presentation this morning. Uh, I believe I've included a brief PowerPoint presentation with this, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, clerks are just pulling it up here. Stand by. Thank you. So my presentation is on community benefit agreements. Community benefit agreement is a contract that's signed between a building trade and uh, the city, province, or general contractor. So written into the contract is a commitment that uh, for <clears throat> minimum requirement for underrepresented groups of indigenous people, women in the skilled trades are enforced veterans. Uh, for this example, I've provided a, an example of a CBA that was signed in 2017 between the City of Columbus and the Columbus Building Trades. It was initiated by Dorsey Hager, Executive, <coughs> Executive Secretary Treasurer of the Columbus Building Trades. We can skip to the next slide, please. Okay, Columbus Building Trades, uh, very similar to the Alberta Building Trades, 18 different unions, 18,000 members in Alberta were 18 unions making up various different crafts and were 60,000 members actually. Skip to the next slide, please. City of Columbus, not too different from Edmonton, uh, around 900,000 people. Uh, they got a university there, a few different industries that they support. Skip to the next slide, please. Okay, 2017, the CBA was signed between the City of Columbus and the Columbus Building Trades for construction of Fire Hall number 35. After that was completed, they moved on to the Linden Recreation Center. And next slide, please. Okay, written into that agreement was a commitment for apprenticeships and to reach out to local communities to get people started in apprenticeship programs. We move to the next slide. 
And we can move to the next slide. We appreciate that we have certain time constraints we have to meet here. So I'll just try to get to the end as quick as I can. Uh, for recruitment and outreach, they reached out to different community organizations uh, to make sure that uh, people that didn't have an opportunity to get into a skilled trade could work with the building trades and get them into a pre-apprenticeship program. Okay. Next slide, please. And next slide. And next slide, please. Okay, they used the project labor agreement. That was what they used as the basis for the contract language. Uh, they've used PLAs in the past for the Franklin County Jail, uh, Huntington Park, okay, and Hall of Justice. In Alberta, we use project labor agreements for oil sands construction, Northwest Redwater Refinery, or uh, most recent example is uh, the LRT construction in South Edmonton. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, for pre-apprenticeship programs, they set up a group, okay, uh, called Building Futures. Uh, made up of various different groups in partnership with the city of Columbus, okay, to talk about how these pre-apprenticeship programs are gonna be set up and how they find a job placement for them on the fire hall. Next slide, please. Pre-apprenticeship program was uh, 12 weeks long, four weeks soft skills, six week uh, core curriculum and two weeks trade specific. They skip to the next slide. Okay, so the four weeks of soft skills. Next slide, please. Okay, six weeks core, and next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is a particular story that really touched my heart. Uh, this gentleman here was homeless, and uh, what happened was they got him into a pre-apprenticeship program, got him a job placement in the fire hall, and at the end of the program, or at the end of the construction of the fire hall, the company liked him and kept him as an employee, uh, so it changed his life. And uh, it brings meaning to, you know, when we talk about a community benefit agreement, this is really what I think our end goal should be at the end of the day. And it's something we should be aspiring to do. Go to the next slide. So I provided some other Canadian examples for other members of the executive council to look at. Okay, and if we move to the next slide, there's the contact info for Mr. Hager, if you'd like to reach out to him for further information on what they did in Columbus. And next slide. That's my contact information. And there's some community benefit networks that have been set up across the country here for further information. And that shall conclude my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, thank you, Mr. Crichton. That was really interesting. Um, um, fits with some other things I've heard about some, how they're approaching things in Columbus. So, so uh, thanks for that, it's uh, fascinating. And next up is uh, Mr. Calver. Hi there, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Executive for uh, entertaining us. And I will quickly move through mine as well as I know there's time constraints and I wanna hear from and Poverty Edmonton. Uh, so the building trades of Alberta, uh, just so I know Scott talked a lot about them, my brother from the electricians. Uh, so I just wanna give you a quick look at our 60,000 members and what we look like. Uh, some unique facts about the building trades of Alberta is that uh, we partner with uh, general contractors and subcontractors we have actually double the national average of women in unionized construction here in Alberta, uh, mainly from working in Fort McMurray and building that infrastructure. And a lot of people went through apprenticeships and came up through the journeyman and journeywoman uh, status through that project. And so now they live in Edmonton and they are ready to go to work helping apprentices. Now we have the ability to mobilize the largest construction workforce in the province and uh, they are local. Uh, we used to boast that we were 75,000, and when oil prices dropped, our numbers dropped down to 60,000, And uh, but they are all ready to go to work, and uh, so our, we applaud you for your social procurement policy that's already been adopted. Uh, I see Roger on the line here, and he's been attending our coalition meetings. We put together the coalition with uh, End Poverty Edmonton uh, with the goal of trying to promote social procurement. Uh, Jocelyn from uh, Councillor Paquette's office came in and told us that that exists already. And we then Roger came in and started explaining all the hard work he's been doing and trying to educate the different areas across the city of Edmonton. And we appreciate that. We believe that the contracts for construction work should benefit three groups, the city and the residents for the new infrastructure that they get, uh, the contractors who gain profits. And where we come in is the third one, where uh, local people, 
they get to work on these projects should a have apprenticeships so that they can get a career out of it and then when that project ends move on to a long-lasting career with benefits that can provide for their families and for mortgages and paying their taxes to the rest of us. Uh, we do that better than anybody else. And we really applaud your ability and your vision to seeing why local people should be building this. We understand that uh, there might be some conflict with uh, some trade agreements and some perceived conflict at any rate. And we think that we can help guide around that and get people to work in the city. We use several different pre-apprenticeship programs. We use Helmets to Hard Hats, which brings military uh, people that are leaving the military into construction. Uh, Trade Winds to Success is our one of our Indigenous programs. And Trade Winds has got a pretty good name up in the Edmonton area. And I work with them a lot down in Calgary for many years. We put 100% of the people that went through the iron workers down in Calgary to work. And we have a huge percentage of Indigenous people working in our locals. And uh, that has been due to, due to and with the aid of Trade Winds to Success. We also use the Educational Partnership Foundation, and that has been running a high school program for seven years that brings uh, students into the union training centers uh, at no charge to the school boards. And uh, the programs range from eight weeks to 15 weeks, depending on if they're full day or partial days. Uh, and that has been a great program to show the Alberta youth that as we have the retirement and the need for trades, that we can bring uh, young people in. And so if we were looking at a possible program, much like Scott described, where we could bring in uh, apprentices and we could put that in the contract, then we can bring young Albertans that have learned this, that are safe and productive into the workforce. And the TEPF also works with the Indigenous uh, flavor. We did a program down with the Bagani Nation uh, down south and we did ironworking, pipe fitting, and carpentry for eight weeks at uh, no charge to the uh, to the Bagani Nation. Um, and that program put people to work on wind turbines and got them ready for the Grassy Mountain project that they were assuming was going to go on. So that is pretty much my rushed presentation so that we could get it in. I hope that at the end we can answer a few questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Calver. Uh, next is Mr. Ampman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Hello, councillors, uh, City of Edmonton employees, my fellow presenters. Um, this is a good way to end the day because uh, I think we're going to shoot a lot of sunshine your way. Um, so, uh, first of all, this policy is fantastic. We, we've become very good as a community at making poverty uh, bearable. What we aren't great as is figuring out pathways out of poverty, and this policy will, will lead will create thousands of opportunities for people to, to leave it's, it's transformative. Um, you know, people get into the trades. Uh, I was told they will make about $17 an hour, but by the time the uh, West LRT is complete, um, those individuals will be making about $32 an hour, which from poverty to $65,000 a year is, is pretty remarkable. I think your leadership has also like started to inspire others and certainly allowed us to have conversations with other anchor institutions to follow your suit. So we're working with the U of A on a pilot, uh, their next big C, um, and that will lead to or should lead to a social premium policy. Um, uh, the police service is reviewing their policies to find with this one. Concordia I did in trying to adopt a uh, policy for talking with both the school board and for the health service. Uh, uh, social work policies in their uh, expectations. I would say the other thing that I think it contributed to is the business community rethinking how they do business um, because there's a recognition that they can also do some good uh, with how they spend and the type of thing they undertake. Um, we'll get into this in some detail, but uh, I think it's transforming the way Edmonton is operating. And for us, hope is that this sort of culture in Edmonton that can be adapted becomes sort of our way of doing business. So when I need to go get lunch, I'm thinking about going to Faro to buy my sandwich instead of going to some chain restaurant or that how I can contribute to the good of the community. That said, uh, we at End Poverty Edmonton are really uh, interested in both the policy and the implementation of that. Our, our belief is that if you're going to end poverty in Edmonton, 
Um, you need to transform the economy, and you need to create an economy that works for not just most of us, but all of us. That means doing things differently, and this is a big step towards doing things um, differently, looking for ways to sort of spend the same amount of money that we're already spending, but do additional good with it beyond the purchasing. Um, and finding ways, and this one in particular, is a lot more people into the labor force, um, and then I get like changes in comes, which is to the very important thing because while poverty isn't only about um, income, it's always about income is one of our sayings. Um, what I would bring attention to is that I think there is a very Edmonton um, piece of work happening around this policy. Uh, what we've done is we know all of the labor force organizations, so your Banderos and your Edmonton Mennonite Centers for Newcomers, we know all of them. We've connected them with the trades who get them into a pre-apprentice program who then have an opportunity to go work on, as an example, the LRT. And you're behind it with both the policy and the funding of that. And so we've figured out a system that sort of includes all um, sectors of our society, and they're all actively contributing to addressing poverty, which to me is a very um, Edmonton thing. We, we tend to want a lot of people in the room before we start moving. Uh, but in this case, it's a really good thing to have so much uh, engagement. I, I think that we're going to show um, the rest of the country how to do this. I think we can do it better than most places. I think people will learn from from our um, activities. So there's a key message. It's not just all the good things that are happening, but the harder the city leans into, into this, um, the more we're going to be able to do and the faster we're going to change uh, the Edmonton economy and how it is. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ampen. Um, next is uh, Susanna Cameron. Good evening, everyone. So I'll follow on Eric's presentation. We at Edmonton have been meeting regularly with the city of Edmonton procurement staff to support the implementation of their social procurement policy. As you've seen in the report, the four social value procurement outcomes that have been part of the framework are employment, skills development, social value supply chain, which includes buying from social enterprises, small and medium enterprises, and diverse workers, and community development. And achieving these outcomes is, as Eric said, really critical to ending poverty in our community. We purposefully aligned the social procurement policy with the poverty entity's objective. Uh, so we're here to support the city to meet these objectives. And my colleagues uh, have described some of the work we've been undertaking. As the said, we've been convening a group that has not only labor unions, but also small business associations, social enterprises, workforce development organizations. And we've been meeting with the staff of the city of Edmonton to better understand how their procurement processes work. We've also been working to figure out how to work together so that when opportunities for social procurement come up from the city or from the provincial government or the federal government, we're ready to respond. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we've also been working with construction companies and workforce development organizations in order to better understand the barriers uh, improve training programs and create pipelines to new jobs. Uh, we've also been working to develop lists of social enterprises. So that, um, if you want to make purchases, we're ready. Um, I think NPRB is really well suited to this work because we do work at the systems level. We have a mandate to convene, coordinate, and advise on the direction of work like this. Uh, we're building key relationships with players in Edmonton, but also nationally with our next speaker by Social Canada, so we can help coordinate this work in Edmonton. And uh, so we're very supportive of this report and look forward to continue working on implementing the social procurement policy. Thank you, Ms. Cameron. And last but not least is David LePage from by Social Canada. Thank you, thank you Mayor, and, and thank you, councillors, for the opportunity. I'm David LePage, and I work with BiSocial Canada. We're a um, social enterprise that works across the country. 
with all levels of government and with the private sector and with community to promote the use of existing procurement, existing purchasing, existing construction to create community value. And we were very lucky to have won a competitive RFP. We worked with the city of Edmonton in the, in the design. <clears throat> so we really want to congratulate you because you've actually been one of the leaders across Canada in the design of social procurement. And we've actually seen how Edmonton and other communities where the council is starting to understand that spending is not just a budget issue, but spending is a reinvestment in community. So when you buy something, it's not just an economic transaction for the supplier, it's actually the potential to invest in community and to, to really contribute to the well-being of the community. Um, we're going to compliment Edmonton. Just recently, we saw like a major construction RFP went out with, with a minimum of 15% value for the social procurement. That's a real message to the construction industry <clears throat> that this is the direction that Edmonton is going. The staff report that uh, you received indicated some barriers around um, the trade agreements. And you're not the only municipality or government entity to, to, to face this. But we want to let you know that those are impediments, but they are not barriers. Uh, they, we've worked with many municipalities to get around them. One of the most, uh, probably particularly the most successful, has been with the city of Calgary. The <clears throat> city of Calgary actually puts out a social value um, questionnaire now and, and weights it on we're doing, we're on, I think, our 16th RFP with the city of Calgary to measure the impact. Um, and instead of asking, this, your staff is absolutely correct. You cannot exclude anyone from bidding. You cannot prioritize local. But as Susanna said, you can prioritize outcomes. So you can look for what are the opportunities to create apprenticeship opportunities? What are the opportunities to create local supply chain opportunities? So you cannot exclude competition, but you can definitely ensure that the community benefits are there. You can ask, also ask, are you a small and value small and medium-sized businesses? So there's workarounds. And I want to compliment the, the efforts in Edmonton around community benefit agreements. Um, again, this is like City of Vancouver just recently, similarly issued a, a major online model for community benefit agreements. And this is the same kind of thing. It's like, how can we use public and private development to create community value? So I really want to, you know, offer a couple ideas. One of them is you can work around the trade agreements by adjusting the RFP uh, social value outcomes. I would suggest you even look at your very small spend uh, working with the city of Victoria. No one ever added up what every credit card and P card spend under a couple thousand dollars was. But when you add that up to several hundred or thousand staff employees, deciding how to spend $100 or $200. It's a significant spend. It's below the thresholds of the trade agreements and offers an awful lot of flexibility. And I think there's the opportunity for you to encourage and, and continue to engage with community and with partners in industry and with the labor sector on the round table that you've, you know, you're participating in now. We have found that's the learning table. So, um, we're all looking for the best outcomes. And I really think that if you can think about your procurement dollars as an investment in community development and how we can leverage the ripple effect and the economic and the social multiplier of what we're already spending, I think we're all gonna win. So my compliments to you and we look forward to working with you and in, in moving forward on the program. Well, thank you, Mr. LePage. Uh, questions for our panelists here? Councillor Paquette, did you have any questions for the panelists? I do. Thank you. And Go thank ahead. you for your presentations. Um, so, and, and David, thank you for those suggestions of strategies. I think that's important going forward. Um, 
for Eric, Mr. Antman, um, I'm just wondering if you could, uh, I was listening uh, to what you were saying very closely, and it seemed to me that there's an opportunity here to involve in Poverty Edmonton uh, in what we do going forward, because rather than, you know, for example, outsourcing to a consultant to help us navigate this, you're right there. Yeah, and, and, and we're, we're playing the role. I think there's certainly like opportunity to scale up uh, what we're doing, but we sort of navigate the various players and make the connection for them to each other. Um, like thinking at that system level, we know that um, most 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 groups are quite uh, silo. And so drawing the connections and sort of showing people the mutual benefits that exist when they work together on things like this uh, is a role that we've, we've played in sort of where there may be um, either mistrust or lack of um, knowledge or lack of relationship. You create a, a system how this is going to work and, and hopefully it becomes the way, again, like you do business as opposed to needing those brokers involved. Okay, so you'd like to be more deeply involved in those conversations, it sounds like, and that would be of help to us. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I think we sort of are seeing how it all works and, and then can sort of are piecing things together. And I don't, I mean, that's that's the brilliance of, of council of design to create at Poverty Edmonton is there's just not a lot of people get to play in this space and, and we can do that work. Okay, and maybe, maybe I can move to Scott and Rob really quickly. Um, it sounds like something like this will actually help lift people out of poverty, which is part of our goal, obviously. It will help people who don't have homes get homes. It'll keep uh, food on the table, keep money in our local economy. And so what kind of community partnerships uh, would you be able to help us foster in this? And uh, um, what sort of like expertise could you bring to the table to ensure that what we're doing uh, sort of becomes the standard for cities across Canada? Well, this is Rob. Uh, we have partnerships already established and, and a lot of the things on a community benefit agreement we're already doing. And so you're right about End Poverty Edmonton. They're invaluable. They've brought together our coalition that's working on this. And a lot of these groups that represent the people that are uh, in need of a hand up, uh, they've been paying for safety training and construction training and not getting jobs at the end necessarily. And so we have in our collaboration by meeting them, we can offer that training with jobs at the end at no cost to them because that's what we do for all of our members out there. So Tradewinds to Success uh, is a great Indigenous program which actually just locks its provincial funding on, uh, I think their end of their funding is March 31st. And so we're working with them right now to try and secure federal funding and trying to find out a model where we can be more sustainable. Uh, Helmets to Hard Hats is a program that will find vets. Vets are in a rough spot in this province as well, and we can bring them in. Uh, all of our pre-apprenticeship programs don't have a charge to them, uh, so they can get in. And instead of what we refer to the uh, new construction worker sometimes as green, has no experience, our, these pre-apprentices just take their chances of success to a whole nother level. There's no charge for that. And we just like the Columbus example, we can go into an area where your project is being bid, say the fire hall, say something that you picked downtown Edmonton. We find people in that area. We put them through the prerequisites of getting in, and then we can help foster their success along the way with the help of with the different groups that we are working on the coalition with. So I think that probably my best answer to your question, sir. If, if I may uh, jump in there for a second. Um, my vision, I guess, for you know how we could make a better city uh, and what our role might be being coming from the building trades and coming from a craft union is if something like a school or a rec center was being built in a part of the city, uh, we could reach out to End Poverty Edmonton to learn what the local groups and communities are, reach out to those groups, get them established in a pre-apprenticeship program and ultimately get them a job placement on the rec center or school. That's, that's my dream and that's my vision for how we might make a better city and all work together to make it happen. Thanks. Yeah. Th that idea of shopping local, I think extends all the way to the city. Um, Mr. Page, just really quickly, if you could answer, what's the reaction been like uh, by industry to this uh, idea? So I think you have to break that down. I think um, initially some industries like the construction industry 
was a bit hesitant, but I think you heard today from our partners in the trades and in construction that that has really changed and that now the construction industry is starting to see the value in terms of uh, employment development, training development. Um, the other part that we're really seeing, I mean, two of our big partners that we work with across the country, one of them is based in, in Edmonton, you know, Shandos Construction is a major leader in this whole discussion and changing the, the industry. The other one is SAP, which is a software company that the, the city of Edmonton uses in your infrastructure. SAP has made a global commitment and 5% of their purchasing is gonna come from social enterprises. They see the value in their supply chains. So then we start to look at the local and small businesses. This is their opportunity to gain access to government and municipal contracts. So what we're seeing is industries actually becoming the champion because they're seeing that business no longer is just about shareholder value, but business is about building community. And this is part of that. Their supply chains become a way for them to contribute, but it also, the better company they are, the more competitive they are in a social procurement model. So you're encouraging really good behavior all the way through the supply chain. Thank you, I'm out of time. Uh, but uh, when we reconvene this conversation at council, I will have uh, a motion trying to take all of that into account. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do need, uh, uh, I understand there's a little bit more business, so we need a motion to extend just to tidy up a couple of things. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Walters. I'll just seek unanimous consent. Any objection to extending just for a few minutes to complete here? Okay, not seeing any. Then uh, then I need a motion now to receive 7-1 uh, for information. Um, and then I understand uh, Councillor Paquette has some motions arising from it uh, that will come later. Uh, so. Uh, so there'll be a further discussion on this. Someone want to move receipt of information? Still moved. Thank you, Councillor. Mr. Hart, this is a point of order. Would it not make more sense to requisition this up to Council and we can handle it that way? Uh, that, yeah, that would work. And then a motion could be made as subsequent when it's there. Um, we could do that. Okay. Sure. Okay. So, uh, so then requisitioned by Councillor Walters and uh, Councillor McKean. Okay. So that that'll go up, and then uh, that'll give you some different procedural options. Councillor Paquette we can talk about that offline if that's helpful to you. Okay. So that that takes care of that. With well, thanks to our speakers for not just your presentations, but uh, the effort and the research behind them. Um, appreciate your patience with us as we got to the end of the day here, but that's a good note to end on, as uh, one of you promised. Um, so then uh, that's the business of today, save notices of motion. I understand uh, Councillor Hamilton has one. I do. Uh, at the next regular council meeting, I will move that administration prepare a report to, one, formally implement a, an urban reserve strategy for the City of Edmonton to work with First Nations that would like to establish an urban reserve within the City of Edmonton boundaries, and to outline how other municipalities in Western Canada have implemented an urban reserve strategy, including bylaw compatibility, municipal service agreements, and other considerations and recommendations of feasibility on implementing a similar model in Edmonton. Spiritual second when that happens. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Hamilton. That's that's uh, that's great. Uh, we'll discuss that next week, um, or sorry, two weeks. Uh, at committee, um, or was, sorry, was that for council next week, or was that for committee? A uh, council, the next regular council meeting. Next regular council. Okay, sorry, I missed that at the beginning, but we'll look forward to that then. Um, any other notices of motion here today? Not hearing any. Then uh, we are done with only a few minutes over. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your diligence and attention today. We'll catch you later. Meeting adjourned.